Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, and for all of you viewing on the web, and it's a nasty day today, so there's a number of you out there, and I appreciate you tuning in. And for those of you who've made it in today, thank you very much. You know, a number of the roads have been closed, and the weather is nasty, so I do appreciate the fact that you're here. We'll probably have a lot more folks filtering in and out throughout the course of the day, only as a consequence of the weather, but I do appreciate your presence here. For coming today, obviously, the, the focus of today's lecture has entitled the notion of the power of problems capability limits in neuropsychiatric sciences to in some way mitigate social violence, obviously, psychopathy, terrorism. Bloom is very, very large, not only because today and throughout the weekend we're looking at the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 crisis, but also recent calls based upon the shootings that happened in Phoenix, those in Oslo, certainly Columbine, calls to science and technology to quote, do something. Calls to science and technology to predict who among us will in fact revert to these types of violent crimes and antisocial behavior. Who among us works as the next possible candidate for those things that we publicly, socially, ethically, morally, legally find appropriate. And so the finger is often pointed to those areas of science, not only where the technology is fundamental, determining the spirit of the time, like genetics, for example, neuroscience, certainly, and the conflation of genetics and neuroscience of this larger convergent neurocognitive science, but also increasingly a call for the clinical sciences to do something, most notably psychiatry. We stand before the possibility of a new DSM, a new Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the fifth edition, that in many ways seeks to reground psychiatry to its biological orientations and revivify the ontological assumptions of the medical model in psychiatry. At least that's the claim. There are those who say that perhaps it will not do this. It will simply be an expansion of the same, uh, a nosological model that is perhaps weakly constructed upon biological basis and very strong social instantiations. Yet, we continue to look to psychiatry as a discipline, as a practice, to be able to identify those individuals who are problematic, not only due to the history and canon of psychiatry very often to be used in such a way, but increasingly so because psychiatry embraces the tools of neuroscience and neurotechnology as part of its armamentarium to see into the nature of cognitions, emotions, and behavior by visualizing the brain, and in so doing, get some appropriation of this vagary we call mind. How then do we literally see into the mind of those who perhaps might commit those acts that we find publicly horrendous, morally and socially appropriate? And if in fact the technology exists, we then have to ask the prudential question. Not so much what can be done with the technology, but what should we do? in light of the technology's strengths, capabilities, and limitations. And so over the next several hours, what we've done for you is assemble a group of experts who come from the neurosciences, the cognitive sciences, from psychiatry, both national psychiatry as well as the international forum. We're very pleased to have with us Professor Antonio Amodio from the University of Bozen Bolzano, from philosophy and ethics, and certainly from law, who present their perspectives of not only the problem of socially violent behavior and perhaps terrorism, but also the problems of utilizing clinical medical sciences and technologies in such a way as to be able to answer the social call to do something and yet not violate the probity of science and, of course, the probity of morality and law. So I ask your participation. We'll have periodic question and answers. And certainly we'll also have a general discussion session at the end. And as we engage the day, perhaps the spirit of the time is not so much to provide you with definitive answers, but rather to revivify those questions that ring true in terms of what can be done given our scientific and technological acumen and what should be done given the moral, ethical, and legal structures and frameworks of what we know about the strengths and capabilities of science and clinical application. That said, what I'd like to do is I'd like to introduce our first speaker. You have full speaker biographies in your packets. 
for our speaker is Professor Carrie Balaban. Carrie Balaban is the director of the Center for National Preparedness at the University of Pittsburgh. He's also a fellow here at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies, an academic fellow who works as the director and co-director of our Consortium for Integrative Scientific Convergences. And a rather provocatively entitled presentation, he brings us the idea of profiling crusaders, criminals, and crazies. Please welcome our first speaker, Professor Kerry Bellman. Thank you, Jim, and thank you to all of you for attending on such a, uh, such, uh, under such climate conditions with the weather today. Um, what I will be presenting today, let's see, where is my, yeah. hmm. you trying to go full screen? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, very good. Um, so what I'll be talking about today is a sort of an update in how we might, this is a neuroscientist's view of how we might think about operationalizing some of the material we have, the vast amount of information we have actually from the, the neurosciences, neurocognitive sciences to profile in a positive sense um, to identify those who may be considering perpetrating acts that we consider appropriate. And the, this actually has a, a long history in the, um, in the area of in criminology and also in psychopathology. Um, this is a very provocative book published in 1977. And so the title that I'm doing is not to necessarily call it politically correct now. What I'm doing is looking back to the 1977 Crusaders, Criminals, Crazies, written by a psychiatrist, in fact, uh, Dr. Frederick Hacker. And in sort of, we call on its traditions for abnormal psychology and criminology, and the neurocognitive sciences approach, I regard as being sort of a modern extension of this. So we're taking a look at it's an old idea that was actually, was actually quite good, and is incorporated in criminology and investigation to a great extent, and putting a little bit of more of a neuroscientific and systems of systems perspective. So I just, I, I've added this in if anyone wants it. Here are just some selected, these are sort of some materials that this is based on to show that it comes from the tradition. Now, if we think about looking at profiling for the individual, we, we're interested in identifying the individual. Well, there are going to be certain factors that are individual, which can come from the neurocognitive sciences, neuroscience, and psychiatry. Basically, what are the person's properties? How do they process information? How might they act? That is changing their awareness or situation assessment, the way they are operating is changing based upon influences. This steps us out of the social framework. Social networks, um, narratives that they listen to relative to acceptable roles for how to behave. We have to pay attention to this. This is all the media that we're exposed to. This is our society and societal influences um, all coming into play on as influences. And it's an intermix with the circumstances. All of these things will prompt the person to act under those conditions. So if we're thinking about meaningful profiling, we need to know something about the person and how they're interacting with the narratives in society around. And if we think about this, what it sort of falls down to, this is taken from, actually, the cop, this is taken from an article published in Synesis, the Journal of the Potomac Institute, a little while uh, uh, earlier this year. But we basically have an interaction the way we work between three different domains. There's a domain we can call neurological, which, sort of, which we understand on a neurologic basis. We take in information, we perceive, and we act. These are things we're good at measuring in neuroscience. There are a lot of things we're not good at measuring in neuroscience. For example, things we will call mental activity. Okay? And the influences on the individual, we know these things, but we know them not through the quantitative tools of neuroscience, but through the quantitative tools developed in, in the psychological sciences, social sciences, and the neurocognitive sciences. And then there's a very interesting area, this is the interface, which we call the interoceptive system, which I speak about a lot. The interoceptive system is that area that sort of tells you, how do I feel? In the brain, it involves an area called the parabrachial nucleus. It's linked to limbic areas, such as the amygdala, and the, this, this representation is a very important interaction with the area of the brain called the insula for coming up with, for regulating our emotions, for regulating how we feel about things, detecting is, are things quite right and is everything quite in balance? And these are things that give us our situation assessment. 
And so there are going to be tools that we can bring from sciences from each of these areas to bear upon the person's situation assessment, which we can say is something they take into consideration when they're deciding how they're going to act. Um, it's a very short running over of this because it's very short going over something that we can speak about for a long time or offline. Now, um, when we're speaking about terrorist actions, we have various definitions of it. It's basically using some form of violent action in order to obtain some kind of a political goal or a coercive goal on other individuals. And we see this placed in our, we see this in the definitions in the Department of Defense. We see this in the federal in the federal definition. We see in the FBI definition. Now when we look at people who are engaging in these kinds of acts, who are they? Let's go back, let's take ourselves back because the individual is ultimately the person who's going to be acting. And that's where I very much like looking back to um, Hacker's book. He characterized three kinds of individuals, definitions. You have the ideolog ideologically driven individuals, which we see, and they're going to be members of this in every group, by the way. He points out they could be mixtures of these people operating in the same group. So those who are the believers in the ide ideology, they are driven by this, and this is going to cause them to act. This can range anywhere from neo-Nazis through jihadists, through environmentalists, through animal rights activists and others can all be acting. They all fit into the same category. We have the criminals. There are a number of violent individuals who just use this as an excuse. It's a good place to operate. It's a good way to act this out. And um, one example we saw recently in Pittsburgh last year, we hosted the G20. We, were, we had a large contingency of anarchists who came. And these are people who were taking this as an opportunity to smash windows in different neighborhoods in the city. And we have the ACLU making a lot of fuss because the police did handle it quite effectively. Um, we also have, um, who get mixed in with this, some people who are a little bit imbalanced. You call them crazies, but mentally imbalanced individuals who, again, become tied up in the group for whatever reason. So this tells us that there are very interesting social dynamics that take place in these groups. People filling different roles was one thing. Now, when we take a look at the terrorist typologies, if we look at the Secret Service typology, they don't really deal with these psychological variables. We, they're not de when we take a look at the way we usually classify it, we're classifying them based upon a scheme that really doesn't capture this. That's all I wanted to point out here. We classify them by something that really isn't going to help us very much in terms of identifying them. What we really want to look at, one would argue, based on the from, from our sciences, are these kinds of interactions. In other words, how the brain converts the information to behavior, how this is shaped, and I have arrows going both ways, because these are shaping and influencing each other continuously, okay? It's a continuously updating system. So we're not interested in a static pattern recognition. What we're interested in understanding is this individual and how they operate within the context of these particular environmental factors, and particularly one area that may be that is of great interest to many of us now, is looking at how the individuals interact with their influences. And that's an area where we can see how they engage themselves with the various social networks, narratives, and storylines for how to act this out, where there may be some real areas for inroads based upon what we can measure in the neurosciences and what's being done in the cognitive sciences. Now, when we take a look at domestic acts, again, this reflects the great the terrorist acts listed by the FBI. This reflects a great diversity. If you take a look at the, 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 the FBI report on terrorist actions between 2002 and 2005, we don't see actions that we think are normally terrorism. Environmental activists, we see animal rights activists. In fact, as a basic science researcher, I had the honor of being contacted by the FBI in Pittsburgh once to say that I was a likely target of the animal rights people that were coming to our city a couple of years ago. And, you have, and these individuals are very, very active um, in different places, and they attack researchers and such. And these are all considered terrorist acts. Who are homegrown terrorists? Well, here are examples. We, we, let's, let's take some examples right out of the files. Uh, the Judith Brewery and, and William Clark, these, were, these are actually militia activists, and they were uncovered. Basically, they shipped, so they shipped a package, an express paid mail package, was, shipped, was mailed to the wrong place, they contained false credentials. This was handed over, and they were apprehended for that reason. And the raid on their arsenal locker in Texas, 
revealed lots of illegal arms. And no one knows quite what they wanted to do with it, but they were fortunately prosecuted and they're incarcerated at this point. Um, we have several other examples. Michael Crooker and, of course, our Unabomber. Um, Mike, this, uh, this fellow, Michael Crooker, was a convicted felon. He was caught with a large quantity of toxin ricin, and he happened to be threatening um, to, he, was, he, was, he happened to be threatening a, um, an assistant U.S. attorney um, and making, making a series of threats to use this in a terrorist action. These are the kind of people that we're looking at, and these are the sort of people we're trying to protect. Of course, we know this can range from people like Timothy McVeigh and to our animal rights activist, Dan Andreas San Diego, who is now wanted for uh, exploding bombs outside facilities to support his animal rights notions. Others who we have are homegrown terrorists. Uh, we have the Lack Lackawanna Six, who were arrested again. They're by their number of friends. Uh, what we can see is these individuals probably fall into the crusader category. The first ones who fall into that, actually, out of the groups, although we can argue about the militia group, but it's difficult, it's difficult for some of these militias to distinguish if these are just, if this is the criminal category, or this is the crusader category, or a mixture of the two. So if we have this individual, there's some very interesting ways that we can take a look at their interaction with messages or with storylines coming to them. And based upon this, uh, based upon work of both Lawrence Miller and actually Borum's very interesting FBI law enforcement bulletin article, what we can see, what they report tracing through that seems very useful is their stages in cognition of, or in, let's say, in expressed points of view of what's going on in terms of the development of a person's likelihood of acting. And so we'll go through a series of stages from the first stage where something is going on out there, it's almost an interceptive thing. Something is going on out there and it is not right. It may be ill-defined, okay. Um, it's not, it's uncomfortable to me, but it's not enough to act. They can be a variety of fairly nebulous Things. We, we, let's just, let's, so the response is more like one of anxiety. It's a nebulous thing out there. I'm not quite sure what it is, but I'm going to heighten my awareness a little bit. The transition that's noted in the, again, in their perception as well as in the propaganda is it goes to a point, it's not fair. What we're starting to develop is the identification of a focused source of what is not right. There's still no polarization set to it. But you're getting, a, you're getting an established group. Okay, here's us. So we're starting to pull out this them out of there as the target for the focus. It moves on to, I've identified them, and it's their fault, and there's some fundamental injustice. And moving along to the point, once you've identified the out group, it moves to their evil. I found this, you know, this was, this was written in, in a state really before we, we really got to take a look at much of the other propaganda coming out now, much of the materials coming out now. And I think to any of us who've read and looked at various materi materials coming out from different groups and disseminated in various manifestos, you can see it in there as a transition. So when we talk about the interaction of the individual with the influence, these are some things that we can look at and track from this. Now, the other notion that we can do, the other thing we're going to want to look at are some of the social interactions or social networking that come out when we look at the influences. And very often, the groups will have, especially if it's, if it's not a single actor acting alone, that's one group to identify. When groups form, it's been noted in the literature that you see a, um, a leader, you see some acolytes who are drawn to it, and some of the people more coming down to, so we see here the crusader, you see these are crusader assists or secondary level crusaders, but you also see the dirty work operators. Mostly these, these people would fall into the criminals category and sometimes into the category of uh, what we would hacker called the crazies falling in. And it attracts them into this, this category. And um, in fact, Otto Strenz noted that these groups, noted these groups emerging in 1988 before we saw many of these problems impinging on our own countries. These are, these are phenomena that have been noted for a long time, but need and, need and are a good basis for us to apply at this particular point. Um, what was noted is the leaders have one of the more interesting parts about this 
is the leaders often have characteristics which will go from narcissism through paranoia that are built in along with these groups. And they project this sort of persona and these messianic types of overtones which come out of this. And this reinforces the members of the group. The activist operators, on the other hand, are a variety of individuals who are attracted to this leader for various reasons. The leader recruits them, reinforces various kinds of social needs, brings them into the group. This is, again, a form of social interaction. These are things that we can look at and that we can track and we can identify these particular features. Um, the other feature that we see very often coming in here, and I've seen this in a few individuals recently at the university, are what we'll call the idealists. They want to do good really, really badly. They want to improve the world, and they don't quite know what they're doing. I had to explain to someone who handed me his card and said he didn't understand why the Israeli authorities pulled him aside when he went to Israel and questioned him for two hours. And I said, well, where have you been before? He said, oh, I've been visiting my activist friends in Cairo and in Amman. And he went, he went down the list. And he said, I went to Syria, and I came in. I said, well, OK. Uh, do you have any idea why they might question you? He's telling me it's intolerable. He said, no. And I said, well, open your eyes, kid, OK? Don't talk too much about you going into a room with the Israelis for two to three hours, because your friends in the other places, if they are terrorists, are going to assume you're an agent for them. These people put themselves into these positions, and they truly are naive. But the fact is that we know we can identify them fairly well by knowing these kinds of characteristics. Now, the fact is that as noted, these leaders often say it's a narcissism to paranoia. The true believers, we can characterize various aspects of them. They're characterized and described very, very well in the criminology literature. The good soldiers and workers that come along are again described in terms of their roles very, very well. And this is practical, just pretty much practical criminology as it's coming out of this discussion. And uh, the, you have these whole different categ these categories of individuals that you can look at. So we come to the question, which was raised very provocatively by um, one of our Israeli colleagues here, that um, can you, you can call it profiling terrorists? Can we profile them? I would suggest that using these kinds of neurocognitive features and mapping them on, the answer, I see everybody nodding, yes. And we see ways that we can apply this very, very well. But we've also already applied very, very well. Um, that the fact is that we can see that we see many different ideologies. And there are a variety of predisposing factors that they can identify using the people that pay attention to. But I would submit that many of these are not really the primary factors. So what they'll identify are things like the age. So all right, they tend to be within a certain people who are risk can be in the age range. We can talk about immigration status, marital status. These are all social features that play into that. And group affiliations, which is again that portion that they discussed here. But more interestingly, and what we probably can do much better on using some of a by bringing neurosciences and neurocognitive sciences together is this particular area. Taking a look for person, what they, what they would call personality features or features of the individual and how they're likely to act into consideration. And so when we look at this, what we suggest is using, I put DSM-4 or DSM-5, if you actually take a look at the categorizations of these disorders, I will, uh, one can see that they provide, if we think about it in these terms, that they provide a narrative or a storyline for identifying features of individuals. It's laid right out there for us. We don't have to dig very deeply in order to apply this directly. So if we take a look just at the narcissistic aspects of the individual, we can read down through this and we know we can pick the people out. The sense of self-importance, preoccupied with their fantasies. This ends up, the, their, their criterion three in the DSM-4, the belief they're superior, special, unique, and have others recognize them, and the corollary that they describe their followers as superior, special, unique, 
ends up, I think, being a very, that probably is one that's, that's very, that, that's, that will end up being, some features of this that we can pick out may end up being most important. Because this one we can identify as the glue that holds together the followers and the individuals. And guess what? It's not ideology. Okay? It's a mutual need and social grouping. And it doesn't matter how they're going to act it out. We can talk about a criminal group. We can talk about even, to me, even it can be directed as, we can call this something that holds a good team together in other areas, okay? I think we need to think a little bit more broadly like that. What makes good teams psychologically? What holds these individuals together? How do they signal to each other verbally and non-verbally? This is a whole area in neuroscience that we really haven't looked at in their scientific bases for these that can bring this forward. Basically, when they are developing their group narrative or their group storyline, how do they engage each other? How do they join with each other? How does this reflect their psychological makeup and basic human community and social behaviors? And this is, I think, this is actually a very rich area for future neuroscientific investigation along these lines. We can run down the other portions of this. You know, they, they require a fragile cell. They tend to be fairly fragile themselves when you probe them. This can be very useful if you want to actively infiltrate or probe the group. You can get insights into them. And basically, the only point I want to make from this is if we look through this, we can look at this at all these characteristics that are very well established and understood in the psychiatric and the psychological and in the psychotherapy domain. We have literally narratives or storylines set up that can lay out scripts for how people are interpreting and acting in certain circumstances. First, how they're utilizing their social networks and their social interactions. And secondly, how they are responding to what appear to be circumstances. And this may actually be the particularly the vulnerability and self-esteem we should be able to see this in autonomic responses. If we can pick responses up with standoff sensors, if we can pick the basic responses off of how these people are reacting in these conditions, probes into this area are likely to be very telling. Why? Because if it's something fundamental to the person, you're likely to get a pretty robust response. And so we need to think along these lines. No specific suggestions yet. This is a strategy or an overall approach that we can take to leverage this to better identify and profile groups, not just passively from standing back and looking, but when we interact with them, what are we doing and what are we looking for? And the fact is that this kind of information has tremendous value. We already know it. This is a way of enhancing what we already and so when we come through with this, we, we see that, uh, of course, when we profile, yeah, we have these predisposing factors. We can get associated narrative scripts for how a person who feels this way should act. What are the roles they feel should play up to? Um, how does an American feel walking to the OK? If you feel if you like you're walking to the, if you're Gary Cooper walking off to the OK Corral, OK? How does someone from another culture feel if they're about to do something heroic? What are they engaging in? What are they playing into? All of these features, culturally different and universals, are things that we can identify very, very well now by applying approaches that we have in the neurosciences and neurocognitive sciences together in a convergent and creative way. And some of these technologies, which we can talk about offline, that can work for this, um, if we can build a model of, basically, we can take all of that and we can build hybrid agent-based and discrete simulations to work with these things under different conditions. We can play scenarios out with, compute, with, with current um, simulation technologies. It's pretty straightforward. It takes a little hard work and takes some validation, but the literature is rich enough because it's been laid out so well by the social sciences, by psychiatry, by psychotherapy, and by the neurosciences that is ripe to be done. It's low hanging fruit for us. We have a variety of analytic tools that we can use along with that. Um, we have biosensor technology. 
that if we want standoff technologies to be very useful. One thing that has been underexploited is three-dimensional multispectral imaging of the face. If you use with thermal imaging of the face for some work we've done along with Army Night Vision Labs a few years ago, you can see changes in heat dissipation from individual blood vessels in the face. You can measure, there are about 25 different regions of interest that change independently under conditions for their thermal dissipation in the face. When we blanch a little or flush a little, we may not realize other people notice it, but you know what? We probably do notice it. You can also see individual sweat glands. Well, actually, sweat beads. They cool. So if you're doing a thermal image, you can see the size of it. So they're all of the, and these change autonomically. Their, their location is well known. Their innervation is well known. We can measure pupil diameter, standoff, and pupillary changes over the time. Many of the clues that we talk about as being biomarkers can be measured. And we can therefore bring them into the realm of operational use. And finally, psychological profiling tools can all be brought to bear here. And so what one of the things that leads us to a little bit of concern here are the societal influences. We see, and this is something that concerns me very much actually we see an increasing push toward narcissism in much of our society. Okay, I'm a little worried. <laughs> and I think you can see why now. Okay, and when we ask why might there be many lone wolf and copycat events, it may be the culprit is we have individuals who are being more predisposed to act out. Why? Because they're seeing, because of the influence itself, they're in a culture that encourages them to be narcissistic. And that's in fact, or to let their, not to, con not to keep this under control. And just makes it easier in their own mind to make an excuse to act out and justify it this way. And we see role models that they follow. These are important. These are shaping the individual's reality. And also something we track or need to track very, very carefully and that is changes in the view of different groups and individuals who are the in-group, who are the out-group, who are the us, and who are the they, and the rhetoric. And I think there's reason for concern in terms of the political rhetoric in the United States and other rhetoric right now. It's pushing us toward polarization, and that this may place us at risk for more, less predictable, lone wolf events, which are very hard to pull out. Groups we can pick out because we can monitor. It's the lone wolves that we become very worried about when we come down to these kinds of considerations. And I'll close by showing two other homegrown terrorists, our Times Square bomber, and uh, one of the more interesting one, George Jakobek. This was the fellow whose house was so full of explosives in San Diego last year and was unsafe, it had to be detonated, and no one really understands what he was up to. So I think this gives us, in sort of to, as in, in conclusion, I think that you know a system, what I hope I've, I've presented here is some food for thought about how a systems of systems approach to data we already have, focusing on number one, the individual from a psychological, psychotherapeutic type of perspective, okay, and from a neurologic perspective, bringing this together. Their interactions with very specific influences. These are things that can be potential role models. These are things that are potential narratives that are influencing them, and they're taking on to serve as scripts for their lives. These are the storyline for how they're going to interact. Now, this is probably a fundamental area to focus on attention, using tools that we can develop that are neuroscientifically based. To understand that in terms of circumstances, we'll get a little bit more predictability on how they may act, or at least have an idea of when they're likely to act out. And on that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the fourth question is a little bit later, if we could. Um,
what I'd like to do is I'd like to proceed with our next speaker to allow some continuity with the construct of being able to access individuals' behaviors and psychological patterns, as were so well explained by Dr. Balaban, to provide some perhaps insight as cognitive and behavioral markers to the underlying neurocognitive state. The issue here is simple. If, in fact, we have homegrown terrorists, if we have individuals whose social behaviors are in some way going to cross a threshold of public, ethical, legal permissibility, can we work behind that threshold of occurrence to look for a variety of indicates that may in fact be representative of an early stage diagnosis, indication, prediction, that would allow us some potential purchase or leverage to intervene and prevent. Might we then take the behaviors and psychological outflow that was so well explicated by Dr. Balaban, and through an insight to these, gain some purchase to the underlying neural mechanisms and their cognitive expression, and in so doing, be able to gain insight and perhaps so as to then prevent. Next speaker, Dr. Alenka Brown, presents the concept of neurocognitive assessment and manipulation as a viable set of techniques and tools to be able to afford us some possibility in these regards. Please welcome Dr. Alenka Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Do I need to stand tall? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're great. Perfect. Um, booster seat. Yeah, booster seat. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for that great introduction, I guess. Um, I am going to basically add to my colleague, I hope, um, Carrie's work. Uh, we're starting to get together, um, and I graciously thank both you and Jim and the others for starting to pull me in into some of the work that you're doing. Some of the work that I have been doing, and we'll make sure I have the same thing, um, over the years has been in the area, of, specifically the last 10 years, I've been working in the area of neurocognition. And um, it's falling into the area of neuroscience, neurobehavior. Um, and I came off of what Jim had written with regards to the, the violent behavior from past 9-11. So I leveraged off of that, and I'm hoping that I'm going to be adding to what Carrie just told you and not going down a different path here. So Carrie came from, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay, came down from a psychological behavioral perspective of what we were doing. And I'm coming from a more basic psychometric aspect of the psychological area, okay? So that, let me explain and demonstrate something so it makes better sense as I move on with this, okay? And I'm gonna step aside, so if you need to capture me a certain way, just, just let me know. All right, when I talk about behavioral psychometrics, and Carrie and I have been, uh, he's been, he's been alluding to this, and I haven't really showed him, all right? I spent the last two days working with the Air Force in a room where we were taking some of this that I've been doing over the last 10 years, and transitioning it down into the cyber world. So, when I talk about psychometrics, behavioral psychometrics, I'm talking about those things that Carrie just mentioned, that all of you do day in and day out, and you're not aware of it at the unconscious level, okay? So, I'm gonna give you two or three examples, and when you leave here, watch other it doesn't matter what culture they're from, what gender they are, what age they are. It means the same thing. So, as I'm talking to you, and my hands are parallel to each other, the palms are, you are in an auditory state. You are talking about something, and the words coming out of your mouth is, I'm telling you, I'm listening, it sounds like, and then when your hands go this way, you're seeing it. So it sounds like that what you're seeing, okay, is how you feel 
And if you watch Kerry up here, he did a lot of this, and he did a lot of this. He said, so as we are getting comfortable and we're feeling about what it is that we're seeing, okay, I'm telling you, okay, that's a psychometric. And it means the same thing regardless of what culture you're in. It means that the person is in an auditory state, which means they're running a conversation in their head or they're looking for words inside their head. Right? If their head is tilted this way, they are auditory. If it's tilted this way, they're kinesthetic. If it's straight up, they're visual. And it matches this. Right? There are multiple psychometrics out and the matching of this with the psychological aspect is what we're after. So I have done over the last 10, 12 years, the neuro side. I've been building up this neurocognitive external side. And what we're going to do is match it into the neural side and pair it up with the psychological piece. Does that make sense? OK. So. The cognitive behaviors of what I'm talking about here can be mapped in. And using the psychometrics, okay, we can go into what Jim talked about a while back, and that was the neural technology side of it, or the neural technology. So that, as Carrie was talking about, as you're thinking, and many of you are in here saying, well, I'm very visual. Well, guess what? You are not. And I can show it to you. As you are thinking your visual, right, there's these input As he was talking about. There's this environmental input that's coming in, and then there's this influential input that's coming in to the individual. Right? A group is made up of individuals. A culture is made up of individuals. A society is made up of individuals. You are talking about individuals and the way they communicate with one another. And two languages. Right? We're talking the same thing, I'm just using different words. <coughs> My world is based on the area of analog language. The psychological, social, cultural worlds are based on the language of the digital. Formal labeling of a behavior. Mine is that a neural labeling of the behavior. What you physically do when you demonstrate your behavior to me of what's going on inside your head. These are metrics of a gentleman that was mapped years ago by the name of Milton Erickson, Dr. Milton Erickson. Great and the father of microdynamics. Okay? All I've done over the last years is map them. Reality. When I say about the Minority Report, for those of you who may not know what that is, there is a movie out about Minority Report, meaning that we should, we would be able to identify whether or not you're going to commit a crime in the future. Okay. We have, there is a reality to this today. Right? Cognitive patterns have distinct behavioral uh, indicators associated with and we demonstrate those all day long. So if I could, which I usually do with my audience, if I could point out people and use them as subjects, I could tell how each one of you is doing. Right now, is processing information. And with that, I could also tell you the type of behaviors that each one of you demonstrate on a daily basis. Because each one of these psychometrics have a fundamental behavior that's associated with them. And we're able, to, or I'm able to say this because of almost 18 years of research associated where we've been pairing this up with each of the psychometrics. So when you sort, order, and sequence these cognitive patterns, they give insight also to the capability. So the last time I was here, I was talking about the educational side, where I was saying that if you had a specific behavioral or neural pattern, okay, it would allow you to either be very good at reading, math, or functionally illiterate. Okay? The way you sort, order, and sequence 
those modalities that Carrie was alluding to, that's inside your head, okay, establishes your capabilities. Those capabilities establish whether or not you form a specific belief of what you can and cannot do. So for example, over the last many years working with DOD right now, I have been asked to do many things. And one of those is to actually do a neural cognition on various cultures, as well as various individuals, various subcultures, various groups, you name it. Okay? An example here is just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, is that the Afghan culture we know is a kinesthetic, and this was done in 2002-2003, is an kinesthetic in motive. In other words, they really feel their environment, which is what Carrie was talking about. Okay? And then when they feel that environment and then the information that comes in, they then do what we call an internal dialogue. They run through a conversation in their head. Okay? As a culture, they talk to each other. Their transmission is highly commutative using verbal communication. So, they are very emotive, tonal, meaning they run conversations in their head. Then they, the meaning being that, as they process this information, they run these mental dialogues and scenarios and words, and they match them against their feelings. So there's an internal feedback loop that's going on. They verbalize it, and then as they access that information, that information is also coming in in an auditory, tonal manner. They hear tones. They don't necessarily hear your words. They hear the tones of the words. So they're very much connected to how you say what you say. Okay? Very storytelling, very metaphoric. As you notice in here, there's nothing about visual. Okay? Their visual intake and their visual processing is very, is very minimal. Okay? They do not access that state very often, which is the reason why they have difficulty when our people would go over there and say, I want you to show me on a map how to get from point A to point B. And they would have difficulty with that. If you ask them to draw it in the ground, or take chalk and draw it, they could do that. The images were not what we would expect, but those images would get you where you wanted to go. Okay. So when you combine how they take the information in, which is based on a <coughs> hearing tonal manner, and how they're processing it with their feelings, and what they're telling themselves about those feelings, okay? Their behaviors, and these are very general, right? These are consistent, okay? This country would be primarily illiterate with this type of cognitive, neurocognitive pattern, right? They prefer to talk to one another instead of writing. They would not see the big picture. We, from the Western cultures, have a tendency and have taught ourselves because we have a high visual need how we ingest information, very visual, but they do not. So you're asking somebody who doesn't have this type of neural input to see big pictures and they, they do not do that. What they do is that they will talk and they will take information in small chunks and then they'll bring, explain what that is through their internal experience in vague descriptions to you not to their culture. They would have a tendency to keep communications focused on content, not context. Kinesthetic emotives are all about the content. So if you talk to them, you need to go into their psychometric states. So if I'm talking to somebody who is in an auditory state, I tilt my head, I put hands a certain way, or I cross myself, and I stand in an auditory manner, and I speak auditorily, and I drop my tones, and I put more space in between my words. Okay? This is what they do. They are motivated through others', others decisions. This cognitive pattern does not initiate decisions. 
they base their decision on others. They would tend to require external feedback. They are not internally referenced. They're externally referenced. Right? And they would tend to be more procedures goal and choice than choice and goal oriented. We are choice and goal oriented, many of us. They are tell us what you want, give us the tasking, and the options are based on what you tell us. Remember, it's all about the tell, it's all about the auditory. Now, this is just one example. This same, same set, these same cognitive patterns hold true for whatever culture you're, you're talking about, for whatever individual that you're dealing with. Okay? So, the cognitive patterns themselves, the sorting, order, and sequencing of these cogn cognitive patterns, again, they form your capability strategies, and they do that at the unconscious level. For example, again, if you have an Afghan, he might talk to himself about options and say to himself, I feel this is my path to walk and will pray to Allah to tell me so. Emotional or a tonal pattern with an auditory tonal lead. Okay? So, I feel that is an emotive or a feeling word. Okay? Walk is an action oriented, so it's at a kinesthetic state as well. Okay, pray. Pray is what we call auditory digital. How you do that in your head is up to you. It is not a seeing word, feeling word, a hearing word. DOD is extremely good at auditory digital. Most government is, okay? An example of an auditory digital state. So, and while I do this, I can watch all of you go into various processing mechanisms, okay? Um, how you think we might consider the performance of what we will establish and understand in the forthcoming days of how we will initiate what it is that we need to consider in the aftermath of the course of mission. Makes no sense. Welcome to Auditory Digital. Okay? Welcome to the government. All right? That is the reason when you I'm talking about that, all of you are going and searching for meaning. And you search for meaning based on how you process your information. And when you do that, it's what Carrie was talking about. When you do that, I get to watch how you do it. And all of you based on your psychometric responses, tells me how you are processing that information. Okay, and we can capture that. So, a DOD might have an intuition of the same options. We can also break down intuition into psychometrics and the neural cognitive modalities. And tell themselves, I like the sound of this one. This one feels right. Let's see what happens. Okay? A tactile visual tonal pattern. Mm -hmm. So, some examples. Um, based on, on this being what I thought was, what we were going to be talking a little bit about was in the carry that was great. Um, in 9-11, when I came up, one of the first things I had to do, and I was sitting with a group of people in the environment, and I was asked if I could take the 19 terrorists and immediately assess their cognitive patterns based on photographs and tell these individuals the reason why some of these guys were not, or would not have been privy to certain things and why some of them were, okay? Um, what I did was, out of, the, out of those 19, 15 of those terrorists had the same cognitive pattern, right? They didn't tell me who had been the cop that who hadn't been. They just gave me these 19. And what I found was, out of the, out of the 19, 15 of these guys had a similar cognitive set of patterns. And these were the guys that were not in the cockpit. These were the guys that I found out later did not have the whole story. 
They were the ones that were put in the back of the plane. With the cognitive pattern that we noticed, okay, it would have, I basically would have told these guys, this is not the type of group I would have put in the cockpit, nor would have been the group I would have told the whole story to. These were the guys that were the followers. These were the guys that you give them the task and you tell them what to do, and they will follow what it is that they need to do and, and all the way to the very end. And if they're not sure that they're going to get it done, they will go and find out what else they need to do differently. They do not take the initiative to do it on their own. The guys in the cockpit, the ones that actually flew the plane into our two towers, they had one modality change to their cognitive pattern. Right? They actually had a visual lead. In other words, how they ingested the information, how they took in the information, they had a visual lead. That was the only difference between their neural cognitive pattern and the other. Something a little more unclassified unclass was in 2003-2005, um, I actually was asked to be part of a what we call a crowd behavior project. And what they wanted to find out, the Air Force was, could you, through um, videos and other types of descriptions that they were giving me, could we identify those cognitive indicators that could tell us when a crowd went from a calm type of group to an aggressive or an observant, what they call an observant group, to an aggressive group, to a mob? Could we know when those indicators happened? And we were able to do that. So we were able to determine the indicators, the neural indicators, when we saw a crowd going from calm to observant, from observant to aggressive, and from aggressive to a model. Now, knowing that was great for our guys because that was then taken, put it into a video, and then it was taught to a group of guys before they went over into Afghanistan and Iraq. What was also good about that was they did a reverse. They also said, well, if you can identify those indicators, can you also help us understand how to do interrupts of those psychometrics that we're seeing? So before the crowd goes from observant to aggressive, how do we, how do we interrupt it? So that, those were also the type of neural indicators that we started to look at as well. When I was working at NASA just before 2001, NASA sent me a huge number of tapes, 20, 30 tapes. What they wanted to test was, could I recognize pilots looking at a set of instruments and a cockpit? And could I tell whether they were making a decision or were they just looking at an instrument taking in information? We were able to do that. And we mapped out, I think I mapped out 40 different pilots just their cognitive patterns. So what we, what I, and what I found interesting was basically all I got was an auditory visual cognitive pattern or an audit, uh, visual auditory, a kinesthetic visual or kinesthetic auditory. I didn't have, I did not see any kinesthetic auditory, auditory kinesthetics. So I gave those back to my guys at NASA and they went in and pulled a bunch of files out of their file cabinets, and they started to correlate subject one with what they had found, a good pilot, a fair pilot, fair, good, and they mapped those. And what we found was all of those that had matched up to visual, auditory, auditory, visual were good pilots. All those that were kinesthetic, visual, visual kinesthetic were fair pilots. So I found that was really interesting, okay? And it has stuck with me, because every time I get on the plane now, I actually look at the pilot, and I'm going, like, whoa, do I have a good pilot, or do I have a fair pilot, okay? So uh, I, I have never participated in this, but just to let you know, Karen mentioned something which is great. I watched your slides or recording. The selection of personnel. That's what Carrie was getting at, is the selection of who you're going to be dealing with. And you can translate that into knowing or being able to identify 
future type of indicators of individuals whether or not they may have a potential to flip. Okay, that's that's my terminology. So I've had people that come up and said, I've got this person, what do you think? Or I've got this person, what do you think? Okay. Um, personally, I have looked at it, but I don't typically give feedback if they're going to be hiring people. One, because I'm, that's where Jen gets into more of the ethics. I mean, this is where you're starting to get into a lot of ethics and if you go into the legal ramification. The problem is there really isn't any type of legal or policy issues that govern this type of thing. It's hard to do. I mean, if I'm given if I'm given a set of resumes to look at, and I want to hire somebody, I know who I want. I know who I don't want. Okay. So, based on that, all right, if that were to become part of personnel, then you're really going to start getting into some legal issues. I think it's some ethical issues. All right. So the reality is, we can map cultures, subcultures. We actually can at those levels. Individuals, uh, their cognitive patterns and that thing gives us the ability to anticipate the responses in various contexts. So integrating the neural cognitive patterns with the neuro neural technology, we can formulate what I call the great great grandfather of the minority report. The issues then that you've got are the ethical, legal, and policy issues. So, you, like me, will eventually, if you don't right now, okay, feel that ethical legal policy issues will become a major concern for these areas. Reason, behavior, and it's something I wrote to the of last week on something regarding cyber, was behavior cannot be mandated, that we can't be manipulated without one's conscious knowledge. Ethically, this is a new area. This is the one that Jim's pushing hard, and he should. Right? This is an area we work today, and it requires us, me, you, to establish personal boundaries. When I do what I do and have over these last 10, 15 years, because DOD has put me in various types of applications to apply what I do to see what we get back. Okay? I have to put personal boundaries on myself, ethical boundaries. There are certain things I will not do. All right? Now, based on that, as before I close this up, take a look at that person. If you weren't reading, and I said to you, you, like me, and I like you, know that we can do the following. What I've actually said, to the unconscious is, you like me, and I like you, mm -hmm. okay? You don't, right now, is also an embedded suggestion, right? People do this all day long, and all of you go in and out of altered states mm -hmm. all day long. So, policy-wise, virtually non-existent for the neurocognitive Future policies in this area will not will try to fit the current pol uh, protocol as cyber policy is trying to do. So the guys I was talking with, for example, yes yesterday and the day before, they said that one of the things that they were they were told was that some of the cyber policies, okay, they're trying to fit towards regular policy was like airspace. You can go down, you can go down the pipes, but you can't cross over these nations. Well, the pipes are set, okay? When you transmit, they may go through different countries, they may go through different states, all right? How do you know, all right? So how does DOD go? Okay, you can go to California, but you can't go. You gotta take a left, and you gotta go down then to, to Arizona, and then you gotta come up through Texas. Doesn't work that way, all right? So regulations and standardized neural and neurotechnology will be a major challenge since we are not alone in all of this. There are other countries that are working this. And we are alluding to policies regulating thought to regulate human behavior. 
and that's not going to work. Right? So though mandated, behavior is impossible. One can control behavior through neural manipulation in different layers of the unconscious. And the various states of consciousness provide discernible nested feedback loops of what is happening in the unconscious. And I say this because this is what I've been doing for a long, long time now. And can actually pull those metrics that Carrie is asking about. Okay? So this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more that Carrie hasn't talked about, I haven't, and the others that will follow me. So, Please be open with your questions. Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like to do is like to hold questions until the rest of the afternoon and then have an open session so that all the information is presented to you in a fairly concise package. Um, rather than to piecemeal it, I think that the best way to do it is to give you as much of the iceberg as possible. And you can kind of lick on that and put it in your brain. <laughs> so we can do it with that and hopefully not freeze your head out. So with that, thank you very much to Dr. Lincoln Brown. Thank you. I've got this right. So as you can see, how many of So as you can see, <laughs> Dr. Brown told you. <laughs> Good natural. <laughs> I can't do natural anymore. I mean, the idea of being able to utilize some interpretive external metric to gain insight to the dynamic states of the nervous system has really been one of the more enigmatic, if not beguiling, aspects of human behavior since antiquity. There are a number of ways to do that. Moreover, the idea of trying to engage our biology, simple biology, something as simple as anatomy, to be able to probe the depths of the underlying functional physiology in a way that is both descriptive and predictive, has been equally old and is part of the human condition of self-reflection, interpretation, and of course, interaction. If I can look at me and determine what's going on in me, the phenomenological model is, well, I look at you, and I must be able to determine the same thing happening with you. And early, we heard the idea of Gigerenz's notion of a heuristic. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that becomes increasingly important is that as we move into this area, of ever-expanding science and technology, it's being able to be leveraged in the socio-cultural, increasingly political and economic realm. The way we embrace various heuristics becomes critically, I think, reliant upon social values, validities, etc. I often refer to the work of my colleague Merlin Donald, a cognitive neuroscientist in Canada. And one of the things that Merlin has done is he's trying to actually take a look at the, the evolutionary model of human cognition and cognitive process. And we've come through the iconic into the more narrative, certainly into the theoretical, and ever more into the technological. So what we find is that technology for us, at least in the 20th century, in this period of time after the Second Industrial Revolution, has become demiurgical. It's become a force, a creative force, by which we define, in many ways, try to create and manipulate our world. Neuroscience certainly has been this. Neuroscience has arisen not only from a sense of mysticism and interpretation, a vague heuristic, but also has arisen out of the very sciences you heard here this morning, a, a social study of the way human behavior is oriented, an ethological study to behavior in general, grounding the humans to the human animal, the, the, the nature of humanity as something mammalian, and then ever more cognitive sciences as we've gone through the 20th century. And interestingly, one of the things we've done is we've utilized various tools from the sciences to develop a tools to theory heuristics of the way brains work to instantiate this thing, cognition, mind, the basis of our social and psychological interactions. But I would argue very strongly that one of the things that has happened is that the same tools to theory heuristics that Gigerenz and Todd have spoken about has become increasingly instrumental in formulating this now 30-year-old science of brain research called neuroscience. And indeed, even if we just look at the depictions of neuroscience in the past 100 years, we see that those things that peer into the neural substrates have gone from 
things that are representative and iconic in the form of art, to those that have become increasingly technological and then demiurgical, not only in our need to assess, but also our need to access and manipulate. These depictions are representative of the zeitgeist, the spirit of the time of neuroscience. And in fact, in many ways, what neuroscience has done is it's made huge leaps, at least in studying the material causality of the brain-mind relationship, but to some extent formal cause, but you know, not necessarily efficient causality of how brain gives rise or, or channels mind, through the embrace of not only this tools to theory heuristic that creates these large theoretical models of the way neural systems embedded as systems work, but then we take that theory and we develop tools upon it. In a bicomponential tools to theory and theory to tools heuristics. And those theories to tools, heuristics, have in fact created this field of neurotechnology. Utilizing tools that are studying neural substrates, structure, and function, and utilizing those tools based upon our theoretical models and constructs of neural substrate, structure, and function to both assess these components and variables, and access them, and manipulate them. And indeed, what we find is that the nature of this is such that this is somewhat incipient. These tools really have existed only within the past 20 to 30 years. And the most advanced tools that we are using, those upon which we increasingly base much of our neurocentric orientation, not only to this particular problem, but to a number of problems in medicine, public life, and of course, the overlying rubric here is national security, intelligence, and defense, is what these things really can do. And so I will present to you over the next 20 minutes and change a cursory review of the science of neurotechnology, particularly the assessment technologies, not so much the interventional ones. But I will do so from a stance of ethical orientation. And the ethical orientation is simple. Any ethical address begins with fact. The fact we have to know about neuroscience and neurotechnology is rather simple. The facts we hold as dear are contingent facts, married to the philosophy of science such that we know science by its nature is self-critical and self-revisionist. This is, in fact, the heuristics in practice. What we hold as truth today, tomorrow may, in fact, be malleable and may be disproven in some cases, and in many cases has been shown to be wholly fallacious. So the whole constructs of the way we think the thing works are then demonstrated to be false. For those of you in the room who are neuroscientists, you know you were taught certain things in school, as I was, that are wrong. We learned, for example, that one neuron produces one and only one neurotransmitter, something we were taught as Dale's principle. Doesn't that sound official? It's a principle. Well, but it's not just a singular fact. It describes the entirety of the way brains work. And so that all came down in the house of cards. I learned in school that the hippocampus does something, that the amygdala does something, and that's become part of the verbiage. Dr. Balaban said, oh, the insula does something. It doesn't do it by itself. You don't see insulas walking around the street doing stuff. <laughs> and although, you know, I was single for a lot of years, there are plenty of hippocampi and hypothalamus that I took out on dates. I have to tell you, the whole person is a heck of a lot more interesting. And so here we fall victim to something called the muriological fallacy, to think that the part does what the whole does. And of course, although we like to use that verbiage because it's convenient, in reality, we then ground that to the scientific latitude that we take because Carrie Balaban tells us that there's a systems embedded within systems, a systems of systems approach, which then allows us to nest the idea of a hippocampus, insula, the frontal cortex, in a larger construct of the way we as neuroscientists have an idea of the way brains work. But you know, the public doesn't think that. Very often the public think that, well, the hippocampus does, the amygdala does, yes. one neuron does, Moreover, what we tend to find is that there's a very attractive Wittgensteinian picture thinking that images do. I started this with images, and everybody goes, ooh, images. And I'll show you more, and they're sexy. They're sexy pictures. Is that right, sexy pictures? <laughs> and that's important, because one of the things that I urge, in the stance of a neuroscientist who also wears a neuroethicist hat, is that any discourse 
to consider the validity and value of neuroscience and neurotechnology in approaches that wage some level of social purchase, as we're talking about in this room, to be not only descriptive, but in some cases predictive, towards leaning in directions of capability and culpability, must begin with a realistic appropriation of what these things can really do, what they really cannot do, and of course, that then gives us a sense of practical wisdom, the word prudence actually means, in the Aristotelian sense, phronesis, practical wisdom with regard to the way we use these things in a variety of practices, ranging from the medical to the public to the national security and defense. And so what we find is there's a whole number of these different technologies that are currently available to us. And many of these are now into second and third generation. This is the short list of those that we ordinarily would use to assess brain function, and through this to extrapolate mechanisms of cognitive function, scanning brains and determining minds. That's metaphorical, because we don't do that. We started out with simple plain film x-rays, I don't even leave it there, because it's rather anachronistic, and it only sees the static image of the brain, and you gotta get some of the stuff in there, like air, the old pneumographs, which are horribly painful, but it was pretty good, like, oh, look what I can see. We went from that to another form of x-ray called computer tomography. We then utilized some form of radioactive isotope called positron emission tomography. We improved upon that with something called SPECT, which is single photon emission, the decay of a particular particle. We then went to this thing of magnetic resonance imaging, sometimes called nuclear resonance imaging, but that scared people, so we got rid of that word. We can now find that we can actually functionally assess particular types of brain structure, activity. We can then trace a variety of pathways, and when we couple all of these things to physiological indices and then map those indices, utilizing quantitative and qualitative computerized metrics, we then find a much broader capability to look at both structure and function. And then, of course, we can marry that to what are the blueprints of the brain and what parts of the brain's blueprints are being expressed, and these are things like neurogenetics and neuroproteomic screens. That sounds like a pretty impressive armamentarium of what these things do. Let's just take a look at what these things are. Well, this is positron emission tomography. And for those of you who are watching at home, I'm not going to bore you with reading through all of this, what this does. You can do that on your own. I'm happy to send you these slides. These actually come from a recent chapter in a book that we're doing, which is called Advances in Neurotechnology, Ethical, Legal, and Social Issues. This defines the field. Here in, 19, in 2006, the Potomac Institute was tasked by DARPA to do something called the Neurotechnology Future Study, which essentially painted a portrait, an interpretive portrait, of what the field of neurotechnology is doing. Not necessarily what it can do or should do, but what it is doing. And we saw that many of these technologies at that point were incipient. Now, many of them are mature into second and third generations with all of the wonderful adolescent vigor that second and third generations give you. Think of yourself as an adolescent. Wow, all the stops come off, you've got all this power, but you know, you can get in trouble if you don't use it right. <laughs> Same here. So positron emission tomography is rarely used these days because it is something insipid. You know, we're funny people. We come with a great technique that goes, wow, it's really cool, mm -hmm. until something else comes along and goes, wow, that really sucks. <laughs> now we use the new thing. And very often we fall victim to that. However, in this area, what we're trying to do is to try to create a very large, finely grained and three-dimensional picture, and I use three-dimensional both metaphorically and literally, of what's going on in brain structure to in some way define and predict function. This isn't bad, because what this actually does do is it provides some spatial identification of metabolic activity in the brain, but its major limitation is that it's a fairly short duration scan. We have to use radio tracers. So, of course, you can imagine to yourself that the ability to use this in the field is going to be limited. It would be very difficult for me to say, well, let me just see if I can get some insight to your spontaneous cognitive activity as I stick you with this radio label tracer and then rush you into a scanner. You can see that the ecological validity of that might be threatened. But the pictures are cool. <laughs> we love this stuff. There are actually people who I've heard talk, now certainly they're not neuroscientists, but I have heard colloquialism that says, when the neurons in the brain light up, mm -hmm. yeah. ladies and gentlemen, I was trained as a neuroanatomist, they ain't this color, and <laughs> they're not like this for easy ID. <laughs> they really don't light up this way. They really don't light up at all. <laughs> we do this. This is as much art as it is science. 
This is, in fact, a photometric evaluation based upon spectral translation of various activity signals of the radio tracer's decay that is then picked up by a form of x-ray. Pictures are really cool, and they do show regional activity. And we've come to utilize our iconography that red means hot and blue means cold. So there's not a lot of activity there. But let's not kid ourselves. We're the ones who sort of set the threshold. And when we use this thing, we set the threshold a little higher. We use single photon emission forms of computerized tomography that characteristically is going to use a radio tracer that has a longer half-life. Ordinarily, what we use here is technetium-99. Again, we have to inject something into someone, and then they engage in a bunch of activities. You know, think about your puppy dog. Think about you blowing up a building. Think about you using your hands like this. But, but it, it is useful in that regard because it, it here identifies patterns of cerebral blood flow, but it has a poorer spatial resolution. But in the cerebral blood flow, we're also able to see particular uptake in brain regions, not just blood flow, uptake of the tracer into particular regions. Here, too, this is a metabolic indicator. Neat pictures. And there's a time resolution that we can use. What's being used where? So we get a, a temporal presentation. And then we match these to standard structural MR, magnetic resonance. These are what's known as Telerac coordinates. And we put these down and then overlay these images on it. And through a computer translational program, what we get is a superimposition of a brain image in these fields of orientation that are then superimposed upon a magnetic resonance image. This is a compositional or composite image. Is it useful? Yeah, it can be very useful. And these types of studies were in fact widely used to determine where certain brain chemistries may be active and where particular brain regions may have differential neurochemical distributions. It helps us to map, if you will, the geography of the relative chemistry and metabolism of the brain. Not bad. This is the thing that gives everybody the willies. I mean, people swoon, horses whinny, men faint when they see these images. You can't swing a wet rag over your head without hitting an fMRI of something. And people love this because it's as shown in the fMRI image. Well, Let's just analyze this a little, because this represents third generation neuroimaging. Not fourth, not fifth, there's more of them. This is third. This is adolescent. What does it really do? Well, it relies upon blood flow, but it uses a paramagnetic signal based upon oxygenated and non-oxygenated blood, with the assumption that brain levels of activity will, in fact, purge oxygen from the blood. And as a consequence, the more active it is, the more oxygenated blood it will need. So the difference between me standing here and let's say that Dr. Howe is blood flow, I'm really active, I take oxygen from him, and then when he passes me by, boom, he's deoxygenated. There's a different paramagnetic signal. This is called the blood oxygen level demand signal. And it should come jumping out at you that what this really measures is blood flow <laughs> and oxygen level in the blood. It is, in fact, a measure of, quote, vein, not brain. And it is poorly temporal. Let me tell you how poorly temporal it is. Very often, this signal takes as long as 7 to 17 seconds, which in neurological terms would be the same as me saying, well, what I'd like to do is see how you feel. And then what I do is I look at you for a year. Oh, that can happen in a year. Neurons respond in scales of nano to milliseconds. Moreover, this is gross regional stuff. This would be like me going to a football stadium, watching somebody do the wave, and trying to figure out what kind of an accent somebody had. <laughs> oh, they must come from this canton in Switzerland. Can I do it? <laughs> Not really. But it's pretty as hell. <laughs> We can get regional activity here, but let's not kid ourselves. Again, if I crack open somebody's head, I don't see pretty neurons color-coded for easy ID, unless they cracked open my head, in which case they probably would. But what we do see here is a relatively good measure of anatomical distribution of activity. The problem with that is people have to do something to do it. I just can't put somebody in the scanner and go, oh, look what's happening here. They're thinking about this. I have to match this to some identikant or task, and then determine what is happening. Moreover, I set 
the level of threshold as to what represents signal and noise. That's like me, for those of you, I think around, most of you about my age, there's a show called The Outer Limits. We control the horizontal. We control the vertical. We control the fMRI. So I control what is signal and is noise. You know how a brain really works? Everything fires all the time. But at different levels of firing temporal patterns and network engagements, so what I'm really seeing in the brain is a lot of sound, if you will, and I'm being metaphorical, at once. I have to determine, based upon some parsing, based upon what's called the statistical parametric program, of what I wish to discern out and parse as being a viable signal versus background. I have to do that. And the reason I have to do that is that allows me to increase the Gaussian kernel to a very, very sharp level so that I can then get this stuff published. If I were to actually get a representation of relative brain oxygen level activity in the normal waking brain, what it would look like is sort of like a Jackson Pollock painting. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who like Jackson Pollock, you'd say, well, it's great to hang on the wall, but it's really great to hang somebody from an end of a news because of. And so what we're really seeing here is that there are some very strong limitations, technical limitations. The new one is, is this. This is called defense, uh, uh, diffusion tensor imaging. And it's a little different. It works on an anisotropic signal that bases the idea of different water spins, which are called eigenvectors of physical activity, that really allows us to then trace some of the temporal and spatial relationships in these longer axonal pathways. So we're not looking at paramagnetic signals of blood, oxygenated, non-oxygenated blood. We're actually looking at water-based signals and differential spin on the H2O molecule. What that allows us to do is to pick track tracing. It's called anisotropic tracking. So we get a very nice picture of neurological tracts. So we can then marry that, for example, to fMRI and perhaps SPECT to be able to show what tracts are available and active and perhaps even a temporal sequence. Toe bone goes to foot bone, goes to leg bone. But we do so in a fairly contrived sense. Think about this. Do that. Engage this puzzle. We can't just put somebody in there, show them, go, ah, they're thinking about accounting. So I can't do that. But it does reveal these white matter tracks, which helps me to then get a much better idea of the neurological networks. Look at that. You can hang that sucker on the wall. That's pretty. And what that shows me is differential activity going from these various areas. And this is actually an area being engaged by a pain signal that's in the, the, the deeper areas of something called the cingulate gyrus. So this is actually part of a pain signal that conjoins part of this other region here, which is part of the frontal limbic system. So this is, if you will, has been touted as network activity of the brain in pain. Oh, I see that, right? Now, one of the things we can do is we can get over some of the, the temporal issues that we find with these imaging techniques by marrying them or co-registering them to physiological techniques that do have a very, very high temporal sophistication and temporal acuity. These, there are a number of them. The two that we use often are called magnetoencephalography and quantitative encephalography. They're really derivative of the old EEG leads, but these have many more. We need to use 200 to 300 sensors. You've seen this thing. It basically looks like a hairnet from hell. Uh, it's like Rocky Horror kind of thing with a whole bunch of wires out of it. It was the picture that I showed right over here in this. And very often what we do is we link this then to superconducting quantum inference devices, which are called squids, that then allow a really good temporal signal to be processed from the brain. This too must be colorimetrically processed and translated so that we then get a very, very nice temporal image of what's going on where. So it's a temporal depiction of brain activity, about less than 10 milliseconds, very, very fast. The major limitation is that the signal does not carry from the deep levels. So we're only looking at some of the more superficial levels of the brain. This is the way it's done. And this is what we get looking like. And then this is mapped onto a computational model of brain regions that allow us to say that this is a control, and this is a patient. And you can see that this brain area is very active in the control, whereas that brain area is less so. Here what I get is very little activity in this brain hemisphere, whereas in this activity I get a little more. So we're able to say that in cortical surfaces, once I map this, and I have to then use a structural map, which again involves a computational program that is human-based and derived, I then get a signal that looks like this. Is it useful? Sure it is. Is it definitive? Of course not. Then I can say, well, these images are really nice. But what I really want to do is I want to take a look at predispositions. Mm -hmm. I mean, this may show me what's going on, but it does very little help me predict anything, right? I mean, 
What I really want to do is I want to see like if you were born a crusader, a crazy, or a criminal. <laughs> well, the Human Genome Project, we spend gazillions of dollars here. <laughs> Why don't we use that? And in fact, we do recognize that there are a number of genes, and there is an entire component of the human genome that is neurologically dedicated, that are in fact dedicated to the production of the neural structures that are involved, not only in brain, but in other neurological uh, structural functional components like spinal cord, the periphery, etc. But we also do recognize that there are a discrete set of genes that code for brain structure and function, and that these genes are not only populational, genomic, they are also individual, genetic, and we can then trace genes to various proteins, which are called proteomics. The reason for that is simple. Genes give us nothing more than a blueprint, but they do tell us where certain, quote, rooms on the house might be, and then we can determine whether or not these genes code for proteins, which are called neurophenotypics, and we can then plot those proteins as a consequence of various experiences, activities, environments, and this is called cladistic or phylogenetic analyses. Of course, this is rather useful. So what it does is identifies the existing genetic complement of an individual and helps to predict structure and function relations through the identification of DNA codes, RNA codes, and ultimately protein metabolism. And what we're really doing with that is this. We're looking up here in this level we're looking at the fact that genotypes produce particular phenotypes. And if I can understand the genotype, I may be able to understand the prediction, or at least disposition for, particular phenotypes for structure and maybe even function. Now, I will tell you, there is some very strong ecological validity in linking genotypes and phenotypes to the expression and pattern of particular forms of neural images. This is some of the work that my colleague Fabrizio Ferrand and I are, are dealing with and trying to study to be able to determine whether or not this has some real validity and ergo value. Some of the groups that are doing this are not only folks in the Mind Research Network in New Mexico and the University of New Mexico where I play, but also the University of Tübingen, the University of, of Heidelberg, and Charité Hospital in Berlin. And there is some value to this because it provides both a predictive index as well as an expressive index, and when co-registered, when brought together, it can do a pretty nice job in being both predictive to some extent, and when we're looking at certain disease states, I mean true disease states, neurological disease states, for example, prophylactic. Of course, there are a number of cons that go with any use of genetics, and these include the fact that they can be very stigmatizing. You is your genes, and you is your phenotype, so to speak, and so it becomes neuroontological. And the problem here is that we may also have some partial knowledge. We say that the genes may be involved in, but this is not a linear projection. And of course, the other issue here is we may be able to make predictions that we can't do anything to change it. And the reason for that is simple, because we're really looking at genes and phenotypes as part of something called the spectrum expression. And the spectrum expression is that the genotype plus the phenotype is interactive with the environment, and this is what ultimately gives us this expression of effect. We then put some decisional threshold, a practical kind, to go norm or abnorm, crusader or crazy. And what we've really done is we've attached social value as a practical kind to some form of biological structure and functional indices, which incidentally, we've also had to contribute because we're the ones who are applying the statistics. And so what we find is the current uses for all of these techniques, both singularly and in convergence, are as follows identification of brain structure, and to some extent activity levels, so that you can then get regional mapping studies. And many of these things have been used pre-surgically, most notably the work of Joy Hirsch at Columbia University, who's used both some genetics and proteomics together with functional neuroimaging to determine how to guide the neurosurgeon in situ. This is this guy's landscape and geography for where he processes X, Y, and Z. Don't cut here, cut here. There is some value to that. What you tend to do is you get substrate and mechanism description. Well, this is the real estate for X, and this is the mechanism that goes along there. It illustrates brain activities involved in observed reactions and behaviors. So what you do is you literally take something of an ecological model, let somebody do something, touch your nose, scratch your eye, whistle Dixie, whatever, and then you see what's going on in brain, and also perhaps what proteins are being activated through biomarkers. And then we're also using this to predict certain brain states predict certain brain states that we then correlate to cognitions, emotions, and behaviors. This is your brain doing X. And if your brain does this, then you are that. 
It should become apparent to you that there was nothing I said in the previous 25 minutes that would lead me to be able to validly predict from the images that I have shown here. Describe, illustrate a correlation, again, not causality, a correlation, but predict that a particular brain image will in fact be indicative of future behaviors or an ongoing pattern of behavior, given the technological limitations that exist, all ethics aside, ladies and gentlemen, technologically, that's outside the ballpark. So the issues that we confront with these very advanced neurotechnologies come from the point that they're sexy. Oh, these images are really cool. They are. And they do what they do very, very well. But for those of us who use this, the question we still ask, what are we really imaging? Gross areas of brain real estate that may not necessarily be indicative of the actual network pattern, but rather just sort of a gamish, a large area like sort of the wave in a football stadium. I can't hear individual voices. I really can't even see where sort of members of a particular cheering squad are. Moreover, sometimes I'm not even imaging a neurological signal. I'm, I'm imaging a vascular signal and a metabolic signal. That may be very, very different given a whole bunch of other states. Now certainly that may be fodder for other interpretation that when linked to things like a link is neurocognitive and certainly a larger systems approach may be valid, but still. And one of the problems here is that I see the brain image and then I link the condition to it. That's the, uh, the fallacy of linking the antecedents to the consequences. Oh, look, there's a rabbit on the ground. Therefore, I make the assumption that somewhere along the line, the Easter Bunny has visited. It, it could be Santa. It could be something different. The <laughs> other issue here is that I have to use fairly large databases to really get a good comparative and normative index. We've addressed that here previously, both in the conference we had last month and in the conference we had at NVU, the idea of linking neuro to cyber. And you need, you need these large databases and data banks to do that with any real value and validity. There's also the predictive nature of the image. We love to think that this is a picture of X, but it isn't. Moreover, what can we predict from that? This is a picture of X at Y time, not necessarily of the future. But where it really gets funny is this whole issue. Because very, very likely, you tend to get these misperceptions of results and outcomes. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why hard neuroscience goes soft. Uh, many of these have to do with open media, inclusive of the, the increasing use of open access journals and rapid access to very, very broad levels of the population that go outside of the rigor and stringency of the academic tower. But you also find that these things have a tendency to not just name and frame, but they make particular claims that then may be blaming. Have to be cautious with the way we use these technologies. But obviously, not only is this technically and ethically an important factor. What we find is that these things are increasingly being leveraged into courts of law. And I, I won't steal Admiral Gordon's thunder at all, but one of the things that is happening increasingly is that we see the use of two forms of legal standard, Fry and Daubert standards, being leveraged to determine the value of various neurotechnologies such as this to determine capability and culpability. And as you may hear this afternoon, these come from very often a decision from the bench based upon the total possibility and, and patterns of use. So what we really confront then is, is this. Yeah, I mean, on this side, we're using all this sophisticated technology to probe into the head, if you will, and look at the structure and function of the brain, but we run great risk. Although we utilize all of our informational and cyber capacity to do this, we're still flirting with the idea of of quasi-phrenological approaches, feeling bumps and interpreting them the wrong way. And those bumps are now a little more than bumps on pixelation that now light up a particular way that we then interpret. This is an interpretive model. And like any interpretive model, it's going to be subject to builder's bias in a bunch of different ways. The tensions that define the field are as follows. A mechanistic paradox. We want to know how things work, but we often have to act on partial knowledge. Yet the technological imperative defined by philosophers like Hans Lenk and Hans Jonas mm -hmm. tells us if you can build it, use it. We have a tech push that's very strongly coupled to the socio-cultural pull. And last but not least is what I've called Anselm's paradox. Namely, we believe first so that we can understand. The paradox is not that we understand in order to generate our beliefs. And what this then does is gives us a builder's bias. This stuff is the latest, greatest thing since sliced bread. But is that the truth? in terms of its technical reality and rectitude, 
or is that the bias? And so what I warn here is that these technologies are sexy because what they do is they marry well to what Dr. Balaban described. They marry well to what Dr. Brown described. They'll marry well to psychiatry, both with regard to that as described by Dr. Howe and then on a more international level as described by Dr. Mahmoudio. But we have to avoid Icarus fault. Mm -hmm. Icarus looked at self and through hubris and pride said, I can build it and I can fly so high caveat to Icarus was don't fly too high because the closer you get to the sun, the greater the heat and perhaps those fragile wings that you've built, you'll have a bias and think they're stronger than they are. And Icarus simply wouldn't listen. So this body was not only one of hubris, it was actually one of the Anselm's paradox. I believe I can, therefore it is so. And you know, it wasn't necessarily that was the problem, but there was a heinous fall and a sudden stop that suddenly rendered any further progress somewhat untenable. And so we're poised on this fence between progress and impediment, between possibility and problematic. It's ours. The builder's bias is ours. And very often what we find is that this folly looms large on the horizon of our possibility. Certainly, understanding is the first step towards correction. But I warn you with regard to neuroscience and technology, sexy and attractive as it is, and as neurocentric as our society tends to be vested, we need to look at these techniques and technologies both with a pragmatic eye and with a sense of prudence, how we perceive, how we communicate, and how we use, lest we too shall melt our wings in the heat of the truth and plummet earthwards towards folly. With that, time for a break. Thank you. Let's take about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Or, or one sort of thing, uh, so we won't worry about that. We'll just focus on so that when people say schizophrenia, they all mean the same thing, something that can be objective. Like if you have two ears, it's schizophrenia. If you have three, it's not. Because then at least we'll know that when the government uses this word, you're talking about two ears. And uh, so it was a research motivated uh, criteria. And then, but then, of course, it lacked validity in the sense of if you're just going to have people mean the same thing that they have two years, then that's not saying anything. Right. And so it's uh, uh, it's about what one can say. Uh, uh, actually, the there's an idea in, uh, in many of the very familiar ones in, in the law, actually, uh, which is for many things like an IRA that makes decisions about what we should do. 
Jim now, I would uh, deign to, but it's then the question is, okay, is it a, is a compromise something with all those flaws better than one thing whatsoever? Uh, or better than one individual? It may be the, uh, an, an evolution in process, like the uh, DSMs over the line that try to have fewer flaws. And maybe, uh, maybe not the best that we can, that anyone can do in this thing. Also, for those of you who are viewing on our web connect, and again, thanks for staying with us this day. Um, hope you're enjoying it thus far. The shift now is going from the what can be done to very often what is being done, with the stance towards what should be done. And of course, that very language is not only the language of science, but that is the underlying language that, in many ways, sustains the nature of the clinical encounter much of the, the discourse of clinical medicine, medicine within the confines of the realistic relationship between the clinician as a steward of knowledge and arbiter of that power, scientific power and capability, and the patient as the one who suffers, the one who is vulnerable, and any or all those persons who then enter into that relationship that then fit within that somewhat confined structure of power and vulnerability, even if such individuals who we may view as patients are not necessarily patients in the strictest sense as being rendered for diagnosis or assessment with the aim of potential treatment, but rather for definition, prediction, and in some ways other forms of intervention. To speak to that is our next speaker, is Professor Randy Howell. Professor Howell is Professor of Psychiatry and Ethics at the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences. He is also a Juris Doctor and as such provides a broad 
and I think intuitive knowledge of those ways that clinical medicine interfaces with both ethics and the law. In a uh, lecture entitled Suicide Out of Terrorism, please welcome our next speaker, Dr. Randy Howe. Thank you, Jim. For those of you not knowing it, if any of you, uh, the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences is the military medical school up in Bethesda. I was talking during the break with one of you about DSM-5 that you mentioned earlier. Uh, and it's worth perhaps sharing just a thought about that. The DSM, which is the Statistical Manual of Making Diagnoses, Categories, and so on, has changed and been heavily criticized every year. Yet at one time, for example, there was a criterion for schizophrenia, which was ambivalence. <laughs> My point being, every one of us has experienced <laughs> love and anger. Uh, at the same time, for the same person, more or less, uh, very hard then to make that a criteria for a diagnosis. Well, there was then an attempt to correct that with the next diagnostic statistical manual by using criteria that at least all researchers would agree on what they're talking about. And so they used different criteria that had much greater reliability, but had much less validity. And so, as we go, it might be that the appropriate question is, what's the least worst <laughs> statistical manual, as opposed to what should it be? Because these are compromise <laughs> manuals of getting experts together. And that even leads us back into narcissism and the whole question of there are narcissistic traits, which many of us, all of us, have. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we don't have narcissistic disorder. And then narcissistic disorder is something like, well, having a lot, as opposed to some. And so how we then go about trying to crank these in, as Jim said, into human beings that we see and try to predict is no easy task. Well, I'll be focusing on a subgroup, namely those who are, if you will, suicidal terrorists. That's perhaps if we want to start anywhere, an easier place to start in that it makes sense logically when we think, gee, who would even for their goals kill themselves? Maybe these people are depressed. So maybe there's something there. Well, as you follow through what I'm going to be saying, there are two ways to do it. Note that in your packet, there is an outline of all the things that I'm going to be talking about that you can follow, as well as a bibliography. And the reference I refer you most to is from a few years ago by Dr. Post, who is perhaps a, a one of, if not the most revered psychiatrist who's an expert in this area. Well, so that you can follow by the outline that you have in your packet, or follow on the slides and just listen, depending upon your vision with auditory <laughs> or, or visual. bottom line, where we're going to get to, is Dr. Post and those in the field say, right now, there's not an association of some sort of psychopathology with people who become suicidal terrorists. That is to say, it looks like many people may be very normal. For example, there's no association of, that one can predict on the way of gender, age, marital state, education, socioeconomic factors. All those may not help us to predict who will be the persons committing some sort of suicidal terrorism. Well, the big problem here is one that's fairly obvious, I'm sure, in terms of hard to study this group and come up with, at this time, <laughs> some sort of reliable, sufficient numbers to come up with valid conclusions. So these are, what we have now, are just qualitative impressions as opposed to quantitative, statistically significant findings. And it's worth taking a moment of just considering that 
Why are the studies problematic in particular? Well, for this group, suicidal terrorists, people can be studied who have not succeeded or are in jail or interviews with their families and their friends. If we look at specific qualities, such as narcissism, we now will have huge numbers of false positives. Thus, Dr. Post refers to psychologies or different sources of this final common pathway of suicidal <coughs> terrorism as opposed to one psychology such as narcissism, using that as an example that we can safely at this time conclude contributes to most such behaviors. Well, having said that as our bottom line, <coughs> let's go back and look at some of the things that may help a little bit, and these might be sort of like narcissism, a way that we can look, sort of like the 25 different temperatures of the skin is a way that we can look. So much of what I will be now saying will be some areas where we can look in the future, though we aren't there yet now. So indeed, as we've already learned today, people may have deeply religious views, that may lead them to become suicidal terrorists. They may have strong political views. These may be together, or they may be separate. As of now, they don't make a predictive factor because many people have strong religious views and political views which could lead to suicidal terrorism, but that won't help us at this time. Well, we can ask the question that I started out this discussion with, which was, are suicidal terrorists depressed and suicidal, as we might imagine? And the answer is no. If we look for a minute at suicide clinically, the persons we'll see on our wards or in our clinic, for example, there are some differences, even some differences. We know that there now may be some people who are suicidal, who are depressed, who have some imbalances, relatively speaking, of serotonin would be among the common chemicals that might be out of balance, and thus antidepressants of many, many different sorts may, of course, help those people who are depressed and suicidal. No evidence that that sort of imbalance exists in the persons who are su suicidal terrorists. Well, there are other differences. For example, people that are depressed and in the clinic and suicidal, they often will feel abandoned by all, perhaps that they're a burden on others. There's much study of what sort of attitudes those persons tend to have. Whereas often suicidal terrorists, they believe in a cause and have hope. Quite a big difference as we compare the two. Well, indeed also as we've learned about, these people who are suicidal terrorists may want to right wrongs, and some anecdotal information has suggested that they might want to right wrongs done to their parents, past trauma. Other studies, anecdotal again, suggest that they might, on the other hand, be displacing hostility they have toward their parents due to problems in their early childhood, particularly problems in a relationship with their father or some other sort of dysfunctional parenting. They may have borderline personality traits, which mean they're sort of predictably unpredictable and impulsive. Again, that's anecdotal. Some interesting data, which again fits with what we heard earlier today, that some of these people may be particularly dependent and susceptible to influence by others. We heard about that earlier, and that raises a fascinating discussion that we might get into in the discussion period. A number of us have prior experience with Dr. Milton Erickson, who he uh, uh, was mentioned, but he, many people see as the sort of father of hypnosis. And he was someone who back years ago, when he was still living, in the 50s and 40s, for example, psychiatrists who couldn't find out how to treat someone, they would often send him to Arizona to be treated by Dr. Erickson, who indeed registered those really uh, 
subtle changes that might occur, such as as one was talking, or their eyes uh, becoming more dilated, for example, showing that they were going into a uh, uh, altered state where he might then make a suggestion, like you made to us, of saying, I like you, and so on, in a way by altering patterns of speech that would deliver a message, and so on. So it may be that in that avenue of uh, uh, dependency and susceptibility to some sort of uh, uh, influence of others, that might be a path which possibly could prove somewhat fruitful, particularly, again, if we have 25 different temperatures that we can look at. Well, we can ask the question. We've already looked at one group. That is the group who may have been traumatized and wanting to right that wrong. Do these people have more PTSD? Well, there's a consideration here that is worth keeping in mind. Terrorist organizations that want to train and set off suicidal terrorists, they are not interested in sending off persons who are going to botch the job because they're so affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. So they want to exclude those who are not unfit to do the job, just as our Department of Defense does the same thing. We want soldiers, all of whom are fit, for obvious reasons. Now, let's take a moment and look a little bit more at whom you would want to find. Were you a leader? Well, the data does suggest, as again we've heard out today in our earlier discussions, are nicely dovetailing with what we're talking about now. Often leaders are godlike and char charismatic. What they want to do is find situations where one suicide terrorist can take out as many lives as possible. And there are statistics on that. According to one study, the average Palestinian terrorist who commits suicide successfully can take out, have, have seven people die and 30 people injured on the average from one bomb. In terms of the cost, it isn't very expensive if you want to fight the enemy that way. All you need are explosives and a jacket, which costs about $150 in our numbers. The most expensive thing you're going to have to get is actually transportation to transport a suicidal terrorist to where he or she will then set off the bomb. There's no training needed over the long run because it's a one-time event. One person describing, therefore, what leaders think of is they say the aim was to cause as much carnage as possible. The main thing was the amount of blood. Others commenting say the leaders are murdering their suicide bombers, pure and simple. So that is the set, then, that leaders might have. What about those who then carry out these acts? And we had nice discussions earlier about some of the differences between the two. Well, what we know about our own soldiers is that one of the biggest motivators is actually their buddies. They live and try to do things for their fellow soldiers, uh, perhaps much more in many circumstances than for the idea that they're fighting for. And indeed, suicidal terrorists may be influenced by their peers also, so that studies of those who have not died but have been interviewed say such things as well. Everyone was joining. Sometimes they're in a group that did share feeling depressed and traumatized by what they'd gone through. Persons who want to find such people, they look for what's been referred to as sad guys, bitter guys referring to men and women, though there are differences about those two groups that I'll talk about in a few minutes. But those looking for persons to be suicidal terrorists may look for persons sad or bitter at their marginality, direct quote. Those who then go along may feel better to die fighting than to live without hope if they're in that demoralized group. And something all of you may know, you may not, 
about persons who are clinically suicidal, often after they decide that they're going to attempt suicide, they may become brighter emotionally because they have now a way out. And that phenomenon has been identified also in persons who are in some sort of despair from past trauma, from feeling marginalized and powerless. Then suddenly they see that this is going to be their end, which we'll talk about in a minute, and give them things to look forward to, and they may become emotionally brighter. Perhaps there's something that we can look at to be able to know who might be at risk also from that. And that particular finding of getting brighter was uh, uh, developed by Ernest Becker, among others, back in the 70s, in books in 73 and 75. Well, what might persons that are going to take their lives in that way feel bright about? They might have a, what's quote, immortality power. That is, they see themselves as perhaps then living on forever. Quote, by pressing the detonator, you can immediately open the door to paradise, unquote. Other quote, it is the shortest path to heaven, unquote. There's also an asymmetry socially that may play a role here of persons who may find themselves empowered with significance through this role of being a suicidal terrorist. If we're thinking of prediction, it's important to know that even families of these persons who become suicide terrorists often have no idea and are surprised. Just like we have all heard of the person who became a class president in high school, who then takes his or her life by suicide a little bit later. Some of the families of suicidal terrorists are exactly the same. They have no idea. One of the other factors that plays a role here is once you start going that path of becoming a suicidal terrorist, it's very difficult to go back. Some of you might be thinking about World War II. And what about Japanese pilots who were in some sort of kamikaze action against our ships and so on? They often wrote letters home before they got on the plane where they would speak in those letters of their enthusiasm, or perhaps more significantly, they were carrying out a duty. Well, the idea is once you've sent such a letter saying to your family, I'm going to die for you, hard to back out because of the shame that's been involved. There are many rituals such as that that take place when suicidal bombers are being prepared for their terrorist acts. For example, during their last week before their act, they may go and lie down in a graveyard to basically get used to, in clinical terms, one might say, get desensitized from the idea of dying. Furthermore, they may send out videotapes for their relatives as heroes. Again, hard to back down after you've made a videotape. Well, if those things don't work, they may in many cases be personally escorted to the place that they're supposed to then commit suicide so that then they can't back down. And then finally, as a safeguard, often there's a remote trigger that if they somehow decide they're not going to commit suicide, someone else can pull the trigger from far away. Well, one of the things that some of us who've been around for a couple decades might remember is that not too long ago, a couple decades ago, there was a lot of interest in persons who would join cults. The idea was in some place like San Francisco, there might be a teenager who was, uh, uh, Jim was talking about adolescence, who somehow has run away from home and doesn't have a place to live. And so it was thought that a group of people might then uh, uh, befriend this person, shower them with love, cut them off from past relationships, and so on. And there was the idea that these persons might then come to have beliefs which might even represent altered states. And there was some notion that you might be able to identify such persons being in an altered state by their having a certain repetitive 
answer to the same questions. That is being out of touch with their usual creativity. And so there were all sorts of things that happened. Some of you may remember of uh, uh, kidnapping these people to then de-brainwash them and so on. This is all very related to what I was talking about earlier of some findings suggesting that suicidal terrorists might be more dependent and susceptible to suggestion. So there are studies, again anecdotal, suggesting that, for example, itinerant workers would be befriended by a political group, which was in fact a terrorist group. They would befriend these persons, but not tell them that what they were up to in the end was a terrorist act, and only after they had felt that it was safe to do so would they then disclose what they're all about. Well, there have been some interesting studies saying, who are these people who might be more vulnerable? And just to pick one example, it might be those who are unmarried and therefore don't have that attachment. For example, in Egypt, the age of marriage average is 31. In Iran, it's 25 to 29. When people get married, 38% unmarried. So some persons have postulated that that sort of demographic feature, if you will, might be a factor in who can get picked up by those trying to find suicidal terrorists. Well, women could be part of our whole discussion. And there are some characteristics that are perhaps worth noting. That group might be particularly good as suicidal terrorists because they, quote, may have a more innocent appearance. It may have a stronger psychological impact on the rest of the world if women have been suicidal terrorists. In some of these countries where they may come from, this may be a means to them almost of gender emancipation. And certainly in the act of setting off a bomb in oneself, one can be equal to the other gender if one is a woman. Well, one of the other problems as we predict and try to talk about uh, who these groups are going to be, uh, we might want to say when, because there's some data suggesting that the persons who commit these acts might differ over time. Earlier on, it was maybe people 17 to 22 who were uneducated, unmarried, unemployed. Uh, but now it may be more, more statistically the best and brightest. Uh, three quarters now may be the middle upper class, 63% mm -hmm. uh, uh, college educated, 73% uh, married, most with children, and indeed perhaps uh, uh, even women uh, uh, that are pregnant may be suicidal bombers. There's also questions of where these people will come from. Earlier on, there was a centralized command. Now with some of the uh, uh, military actions that have taken part, they're more decentralized. Um, and now persons are talking about second and third generations of suicide bombers who are recruited from other countries such as Asia and North Africa. I did a uh, project in college uh, that was actually, some of you might remember, the time when people were talking about the theater of the absurd. Martin Eslin wrote a book about that at that time. And so I did a sociological analysis of playwrights of the theater of the absurd, people like Samuel Beckett. So the whole notion that we might begin to look at, OK, why do people move to other countries, and how do they respond then, might be possibly another avenue might look at. Well, some might say, isn't this the same as we've already talked about persons who are clinically depressed? Uh, what about people who commit homicide and then commit suicide? Are these suicidal terrorists like them? And again, the notions are that totally different group. Those who commit homicide and suicide is pretty rare in the first place. It's usually family members of some sort. And usually, time-wise, there's a spacing when they first kill out others and then themselves. So it's not the same group. Well, those are sort of psychological considerations. There are also, as we've heard about earlier today, social considerations.
And we've heard also already about the lynch mob effect. Well, we can start here. We've talked about cults. What about cult suicides that we all know of? Well, that seems to be different. Different. What about dyadic suicides uh, of two people deciding together? That seems different also. Uh, innocent persons are not uh, killed in, uh, uh, as in terrorist acts of some sort. There are lynch mob mentalities, group think that affect these groups. They justify themselves, as we've heard, uh, to the group and change their logic as they go on. There are various theories, such as a theory of cognitive dissonance, of how we tend to change what we think to justify our behavior. And that happens as persons have peer influences. They tend to see others differently and undergo a subjective de-individualization. We all know and have heard about how these people may be, from the time of infants, use toys which include suicidal bomb belts. Now, a Palestinian psychiatrist has said, quote, if you ask a child in Gaza today what he wants to be when he grows up, he doesn't say he wants to be a doctor or a soldier or an engineer. He wants to be a martyr. These persons may have their family encouraging that because they had their land stolen, so they feel and they may be encouraged in school to follow this sort of destiny. And as we've heard about, they go through a change in logic that you talked about from it's not right, to it's not fair, to it's your fault, to you are evil. Conclusion, can we predict violence? Well, we're not very good at it in most instances, but uh, uh, as one example, it may be increased in severe mental illness when there's substance abuse or dependence as a factor too. Maybe uh, uh, influenced by past violence, juvenile detention, uh, physical abuse in the past, parental arrest, uh, perceived threats, younger age, male gender, low income, recent divorce, unemployment, victimization. May not help us now. What we do know are a few things planners and perpetrators of the September 11 attacks uh, did have a sense of persecution by the West a history of violence, and fundamental religious and political motivations, but all those didn't exist in all people. We have not been successful in predicting presidential assassins, school shooters, and even our Rorschach assessments of Nazi war criminals have not shown the sort of data that we would need to be able to predict that. So what do we do? Right now, we maybe can't predict. There have been other approaches, such as to uh, uh, try and listen to people who are in prisons and see if that will help. Uh, we've talked about inhibiting some of the people joining these groups. There may be ways to do that. There may be ways to increase dissent in groups that can help. And there may be ways to ease their exit, which, as I've talked about, is very difficult. That's about where we are now. Thank you. So obviously, one of the issues that we confront is those individuals who are embedded within socio-cultures that in some ways propel, maintain, sustain, or maybe even instigate psychological constructs that play to particular biological underpinnings, including perhaps those underpinnings that may be very Maslowian those things that may not necessarily relate directly to our neuroscientific basis of cognitions, emotions, and behaviors, and maybe more fundamental. Hunger, poverty, need. And as such, it becomes important to then utilize the science and discipline of psychiatry in such a way, particularly if it's to be leveraged on the global stage, and more if it's going to be leveraged in pluralized societies to be able to peer into the potential problem of not only social malaise, but social violence and potentially terrorism, to gain some real insight to how these different socio-cultural distinctions may in fact give rise to psychological 
social activities and may be the forum, literally the forum, the, the medium from which we then find neurobiology, psychology, and the social activity giving rise. How then do we go forward? How then do we leverage psychiatry in such a way? Does the new DSM allow us that potential of leverageability, or, or is there perhaps some other instantiation that might allow the science and practice of psychiatry as a medical science to be yielded on the world stage? Well, coming to us uh, rather specially, who has been working with us this past week and certainly has been with us before as an associate academic fellow, is Professor Vito Antonio Amodio, who comes to us from the University of Bozen Bolzano, also works at the University of Torino. Professor Amodio is a psychiatrist with a particular interest in a somewhat novel area of psychiatry known as ethnopsychiatry. And in, I believe, a very intuitive lecture entitled A Way Forward, he describes what the field is and poses the question of its potential validity and value. Please welcome all the way from Bozen Bolzano in the Sud Tirol in Italy, Vito Antonio Amodio. Thank you very much. I first of all I thank very much Professor Giordano for inviting me to, for this lecture. Well, the problems to which I am going to address my reflections are focused um, as ex explicitated by uh, Professor Giordano on the relationship between culture and um, psychopathology. Uh, well, this is obviously a proposal. I have no uh, truth to uh, transmit, uh, obviously. Um, medicine begins where technology lives off. And is ethnopsychiatry the medicine that is needed? What, what do we intend by ethnopsychiatry? I consider a critical form of psychiatry study and practice that examines the relationship of culture and cognition, emotion, behavior, and pathology. Well, a refreshing of the culture, definition of culture. And uh, for me, it's very important to consider culture as the sum, total of acquired, so in this sense, biological, and learned psychosocial, cognitive, and behavioral patterns of any group of people regarded as expressing a way of life subject to possible modification by and in succeeding generations. So, uh, these are both a medium and a form, and so this is a, a complementarity. I think that not always we, uh, that a, a great distinction can be considered that uh, as critical premise, culture is not pathology, and pathology is not necessarily culture. So, uh, what we have to understand is the relationship of the factors contributing to each cause is fundamental for the discipline and its practice. And so I think that ethnopsychiatry is the sum of all its of ethno, the elements, the uh, um, ethnoscience that compounds ethnoscience and psychiatry. And these different uh, disciplines um, must be in relationship and uh, are um, always communicate, are um, strictly intertwined. And I think this is a, a way we can follow um, 
as science in practice. And this, each element, um, really influence not only the individual, but also the public service of the, the, the society. And we can consider, on the other hand, the potential benefits, but we also we have to consider potential problems. What about potential benefits? Oh, well, surely we can acquire a more cultural competence. The sentiment of social cultural resonance or dissonance. And I think also culturally specific and compatible treatments. Or discerning psychocultural incompatibility compatibilities. This is also another potential benefit. But on the other hand, we also have to consider the cultural permissiveness, relativism, a sort of gate condition, gatekeeping and psychocultural conformity. We in Italy say Quando sei a Roma, that means mm -hmm. that when you are at your home, mm -hmm. you have to act in such way and not in another. This is a potential problem. So there also we also have to consider distinct ethical obligations and expanding construct of harm to others and so on. Well, conclusions. I think that the core question is, is ethnopsychiatry an answer to discerning culture from pathology? What are the strengths, capabilities, and potential of ethnopsychiatry? What are the limitations of this science? What ways could ethnopsychiatry be the limited. And then I think that this is a candidate um, very um, uh, glad to uh, conclude my uh, relation with this candle. And the candle symbolically represents a light that allows us to bring about a vision in the darkness of tremendous complexity of the psychiatry phenomena in which we are moving in the contemporary globalization. On the other hand, the candle produces heat. And as such, it implies the risk to burn and to hurt the risk to burn and to hurt as a consequence of the fall of most of the expectations we have built. Therefore, we must construct this candle well and hold it straight and carefully, lest the flame go out or we scald others with fire or wax. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. È stato fantastico. Mille grazie. Mi ha fatto. Non è necessario che mi ha fatto. Bene. So, grazie. one of the issues that came up, of course, was not only were there profound possibilities that could be offered by this field, ethnopsychiatry, embracing ethnoscience as science, and doing so in the spirit of science as it embraces its philosophy, anthropology, and ethics. But here, the ethical question becomes paramount. Because if, in fact, we then utilize ethnopsychiatry in just this way, and use it as psychiatry, psychiatry as medicine, what is the ethic under which this shall operate? A pure ethic of medicine, grounded in beneficence, 
that looks at the best interests of those it serves, being the patient? Or is it something different? Is it, as Professor Amovio suggested, a form of forensic psychiatry, perhaps in the English model, that exists outside of the probity of the patient-physician relationship and actually exists as a form of public health? A long arm, if not necessarily a strong arm, of societal protection. His moral and ethical responsibility instead is to the state. And if that's the case, does this then not sniff of the idea of hygiene? In much the same way that we dealt with in the, the Wilhelmine period, the Weimar period, which of course then gave rise to the notion of Lebens und Wörters Lebens, those lives unworthy of living due to some characterization of biological and psychological traits that may have ascribed to harmless naturalism at the time, but now in retrospect we recognize the form of quasi-social Darwinism, pseudoscience at best, that ultimately allowed for the pogrom that we now consider to be the final solution, the Holocaust. How do we leverage science in such a way as to retain the probity of the science as science how do we employ that science and technology, perhaps within the psychiatric sciences practice and, and discipline? Do so in a way that is both technically right and ethically sound. And if, in fact, one of the things we're looking to do is to utilize neuroscience, neurotechnology, and psychiatry, embracing the neurocognitive approach, a systems of systems approach, perhaps even leveraging this new discipline, of ethnopsychiatry, not in a way that's evanescent, but in a way that's weird. Might we be able to piece these pieces together in some kind of a mosaic to determine the ethical groundwork that allows us to then inform policy of how these things can and should be used, and in that way provide some ethical legal discourse that may enable us to utilize neuroscience, neurotechnology, neurocognitive sciences, and some form of predictive and diagnostic psychiatry so as to point a finger at not only culpability, but perhaps also to initiate some form of mitigated intervention. And what should that intervention be? How much is enough? What can we do? What should we do? Our next speaker works with us directly. He is an associate fellow of our academic programs, working with me in the Center for Neurotechnology Studies. And he works with one of the leaders in American psychiatry, Dr. John Sadler. As a philosopher and ethicist, he studied under one of the forefathers of American bioethics, uh, Dr. Tristan Engelhardt, down at Rice University, also one of the founders of the Kennedy Institute, and if not, one of the original, as I said, great eminences of the field of American bioethics. He comes with an international perspective, of Swiss birth, internationally educated, and now works in the field of the philosophy and ethics of psychiatry, both as a medical practice and as a social force. We're working to together to determine whether or not, in fact, ethical -like criteria are not only formable, but formidable enough so as to then in some way provide social and legal justification for the way forward and how these techniques not only can be used, but should be used. In that regard, please welcome my colleague and collaborator and actually co-sponsor of this, Dr. Fabrice Chocorant. Thank you, Jim, for this uh, introduction. Uh, I wanted to use a provocative picture uh, mm. for this presentation. I think everybody will recognize uh, who it is. And uh, <laughs> Jim and I were joking about uh, this picture. I'm not going to mention the name of the person, but I sent him an email showing this picture and said, is it X? And I uh, said, uh, almost, but uh, it's an internal joke. But this is the Joker in the movie Batman. But um, he's considered a, a psychopath. I mean, he personifies the, the typical psychopath. And I wanted to use that picture because, especially, I want to reintroduce this word, this word of evil. Um, wh why should we care? Why should we uh, have these discussions about the ethics of the use of neurotechnologies? And I, I think if you look at these individuals, you will recognize, well, Charles Manson, David Berkowitz, and Ted uh, Bundy. So these people were not uh, 
diagnosed with psychopathy, but looking back, I think we could make a diagnosis based on what they've done. Uh, and, and we could say that these people had psychopathic traits. Now, closer to us, well, Columbine, are all slow, and the shooting in Phoenix. So why should we care? Okay, Oklahoma, and closer to us, 9-11. Uh, so the question is, well, we care because evil occurred. I understand we live in a pluralistic society. It's very difficult to define what the good is. But when we see evil, I think most of the people would say, well, we see it. This is evil, so we should care about it. And so the question I wanted to ask is, well, does or will neuropsychiatry science and technology provide tools to predict and prevent violent criminal behavior? And I think the question is, if there is this sense of right and wrong, just and unjust, can we use technology? Do we have a moral obligation to use that technology? And the reason why I'm interested in psychopathy is because you have criminal psychopath, and usually while well, they're incarcerated, but they're also treated. So if there is a treatment element, if there is a therapeutic element, we have a kind of moral obligation as a society to treat these individuals. But then you have non-criminal psychopaths. So what do, you do, what do we do with these individuals? Do we have the same moral obligation, social obligation, to quote, unquote, fix their brain? Now, Dr. Giordano talked about the various technologies available to us. And we have to be very careful. But I think we're moving toward that direction. We're going to use that technology. We're developing that technology. In, uh, in Germany, they're developing uh, a brain-computer, um, well, fMRI, brain-computer interface, to basically retrain the psychopath to um, think morally, to basically uh, make the right choices. It's, it's a type of, quote, unquote, fixing the brain. So the technology is there. We're developing it. We're not there where we should be. Uh, but this project is basically, we try with uh, Dr. Giordano to anticipate what kind of well, ethical and legal, it's more the, the ethical framework uh, that should be implemented in order to have this technology uh, uh, available to us. Now, I want to caution you that uh, it's an exploration. Uh, I don't have the truth. I don't have anything set yet. We just started this project and we're exploring these issues. But I think it's very important. Yesterday we had a dinner with uh, Dr. Mojo and Dr. Giordano and we're saying, well, this event is like a mirror. We are looking at the mirror and say, where, we, where are we with this technology? Where are we going in terms of uh, the ethical and legal and social issues? So I hope this event will trigger more reflections on uh, these type of issues. So, what am I going to do? Um, I explain why psychopathy is interesting for me because, again, you have this uh, distinction between what is therapeutical and what is non-therapeutical slash enhancement or alteration of uh, human behavior or uh, the ability, our ability to control human behavior through drugs, technology, and so forth. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the diagnostic tools uh, for uh, psychopathy and the limitation. I'm not going to talk too much about it. I think uh, Jim um, did a great job in his presentation, but then focus a little bit on, on the issues we need to address in the future and then the need for future LC research. So psychopathy, again, this distinction is important between you know, criminals who need psychiatric treatment uh, these people are incarcerated, but they need treatment. There are also patients. They're not just criminals. But what about non-criminal? Well, yet, quote, unquote. Um, but they have 
uh, psychopathic traits. What do we do? What do we do with these individuals? Both of them, while well, criminals, uh, they've been a, a threat. They did great evil in society, so they incarcerated. Uh, but what about potential uh, criminal psychopath? What do we do with these individuals? And uh, so the question is really, do we have a social obligation to treat, predict, and prevent psychopathy um, with the tools we have available to us? So um, another element that why I use uh, in the first slide this notion of evil is because in psychopathy, um, the way uh, psychopathy was described in the 18th, 19th century, you still had this notion of uh, morality or moral insanity. But now, it's well, in the DSM-4, it's not an entry. Uh, based on my colleague, uh, Dr. Sadler, I think they will have an entry for uh, psychopathy in the DSM-5. So, but the current definition in the DSM-4 is a personality disorder characterized by emotional dysfunction and antisocial behavior. But what's very interesting is that there is no efficacious treatment available to us. Pharmaceutical uh, drugs don't help. And behavior therapy doesn't work either. You have a high rate of recidivism. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a real problem. And then when you look at the prison population, uh, criminal psychopath, psychopath um, are between 15 to 30 percent of prison population, but commit 50 percent more crime than non-psychopathic inmates. So it's really a problem. We don't have a treatment, and uh, if you look at uh, prison population, it's a real, real problem. So why not technology? Why not use technology to help these individuals? There are some issues with technology. I mean, psychopath, um, usually they're some of them are very well educated. They're very smart, charming. So the, the question is, even if you have the technology and you, you, you wire their brain to a computer, the problem is they, will, they can always fake their, um, their behavior. So I understand this. It, it's a real problem. But still, people are pushing into being in, um, they're developing this type of technology. So now, there are various diagnostic tools for psychopathy. So you have the checklist, you have neuroimaging techniques, and then you have neurogenetics. Jim talked a little bit about neuroimaging techniques, neurogenetics, the problem associated with that, and then here uh, put together this uh, checklist. The checklist here, you have a sense of you know, the characteristics of um, psychopath. Um, if you're above 30, you consider as a psychopath. If you're below 30 in the scale, uh, you're not considered as a clinical psychopath. But just to give you a sense of uh, what kind of behavioral characteristic these individuals have. Then you have these uh, technologies, SMRI, fMRI, and then EEG. Uh, we have a project with um, Jim to look at, well, the limitations of these technologies and how we can combine these technologies and see, try to, to develop a kind of a, a framework um, or paradigm so we can use various techniques in collaboration with neurogenetics and the checklist to determine if these individuals um, are um, uh, psychopath. Now, what's very interesting and uh, in the history of psychiatry, uh, you certainly know Cesare Lombroso, who is considered the father of criminology, and he tried to describe um, criminals based on their, uh, the structure of their faith, the faith, the face, uh, in terms of the uh, structure of the jaw, uh, the structure of the nose, and so forth. So, the problem we have when we discuss, when we use fMRI, for example, technology, is that we're going to try to find these type of features in the brain. So if you look at the use of uh, fMRI, uh, 
Um, if, there are studies showing that uh, if you look at the brain of psychopath, damage to the uh, orbital uh, for the cortex can cause cognitive impairment. So if you look at the brain of psychopath, you see all these uh, abnormalities in the structure of their brains. So then if you look at uh, damage to the anterior cingular, can cause emotional unconcern, hostility. And again, if you look at the brain of psychopath, if you scan their brain, uh, you will see these abnormalities and so forth. So here is a list. Uh, damage to the amygdala, uh, difficulty processing various effective stimuli, such as inability to recognize anger. The psychopath, for example, if you threat him and you're like this, the psychopath will not be able to have to recognize these clues. There is no emotional response. So all this to show you that these abnormalities in the structure of the brain is a, a result in certain behavior. So the idea is to use technology to compensate for these deficiencies. And then you have neurogenetics, uh, but again, I will not talk about too much about neurogenetics. I think uh, Jim uh, did an excellent job uh, on that issues. Limitations, again, uh, I will be very, very uh, quick on this. So, um, just to show you this presentation is that, so far, is that neurotechnologies can be used as a diagnostic tool to assess potential predisposition for antisocial and criminal acts. Uh, looking, as I mentioned, uh, to the neuroanatomical uh, uh, neuroanatomical abnormalities of the brain of um, psychopaths. Now, in terms of prevention, we could do that early on, but the problem is, is psychopathy the cause of abnormalities, or does psychopathy cause abnormalities in the brain in terms of the structure? And also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, these technology, oops, these technologies could be also uh, part of an interventional procedure in uh, preventing criminal acts, like the development of these uh, neurotechnologies. Um, so we're moving toward that direction. The technology is not there yet, so we can implement it. Uh, and we're not sure of the results of these type of applications. But we're moving toward that direction. So the question is, if valid, effective, and reliable, could neuropsychiatric science and technology be used ethically and legally to justify intervention prior to the commission of antisocial violent criminal acts? I'm raising the question. I don't want to just make a statement because legally, if you have non-criminal, it would be very difficult to prosecute these individuals just based on the structure of their brain or just on their behavior. Uh, the joke is there are a lot of CEOs who are psychopath or have psychopathic traits. Mm -hmm. So are you going to chase these individuals uh, and try to prosecute them, say, well, you know, uh, your behavior and, and, and so forth. But legally, well, again, we have to anticipate. Um, what kind of framework, more framework, within our context, within our political context, not just here in the United States, but uh, worldwide with the rise of terrorism and so forth. So we have to think about how we're going to implement these technologies if we move forward. Again, the problem is you have technology moving forward, and then ethical philosophical analysis comes always a little bit behind. What we're trying to do with Jim is to be right there and anticipate and try to shape the technology in the sense that uh, provide a framework. So the task is evaluate if and what neurotechnological methods can be employed to initiate social interventions. And also determine the ethical and legal criteria that warrant social intervention, again, psychopathy and or predisposing traits. It's not an easy task, but I think we have to do it because we, we're moving toward that direction. The technology is moving, therefore we have to provide a framework. We have this technological imperative. It's, it's going to stay with us 
There is no way for us to stop it. The wheel is spinning, so we have the choice. Either we try to stop it, it's not going to happen. Either we, we go full speed and we promote it and we don't think about those issues. But I think it would be naive to think that we can trust uh, scientists, uh, researchers, and so forth. And the approach is this middle uh, ground position where we have to allow that technology to develop because there are therapeutic applications and I think it's worth it. But we need to provide a framework. So there are technical issues. And here, this is not my expertise. This is more uh, people like uh, Jim uh, expertise. Uh, but the question is, we have to be honest and we have to be uh, true to ourselves about what we can do with that technology. Now, there is a whole movement, for example, the, the transhumanist movement. They have all these um, utopian dreams about the use of technology uh, to upload human consciousness. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, to assess that technology from a scientific standpoint, not just have dreams about what we could do. Uh, with that technology. Then there are ethical issues. We need to determine and establish ethical boundaries to enforce the use of neurotechnologies for therapy or uh, preventing measures, as I mentioned. And it, we need to establish thresholds that warrant the ethical and legal use of neurotechnologies. I mean, to what extent society is willing to accept um, uh, psychopathic behavior in society. As I mentioned, are we going to go and chase these people, CEOs and so forth, and try to say, well, you should be treated, or we should, quote unquote, fix your brain. Uh, again, it's going to be, we, we're going to need to have this conversation, not just among the experts, but also with society. We need to have this public debate. Uh, ethical, legal, we need to determine the potential impact of neurotechnologies on moral and criminal responsibility. There is a debate. Oops. Um, are psychopath criminal responsible, so they deserve punishment, and of course we're going to treat them? Or are these individuals blameless offenders, so they just need treatment? They're outside the legal system in the sense that we need to um, we, we, we shouldn't consider them as uh, criminals in the strong sense of the word. And then there are social issues, determine if moral obligation and legal duty to protect citizens through preventing measures. Again, should we go and try to chase these individuals uh, to protect society? Uh, and, and since we're talking about terrorism, um, now, as you mentioned, uh, you know, not all terrorists are necessarily psychiatric cases. Mm -hmm. These individuals can be reasonable within their own mindset. So, uh, but again, some of them could end up being, or could be, uh, psychopaths. So the question is, are we going to chase these, these individuals legally? What are we going to do? I think it's going to be very difficult, but I think uh, in the next presentation, I'm going to um, address that question. And then we will establish boundaries for social intervention in terms of diagnosis, prevention, treatment, rehabilitation. This is a question within the medical establishment uh, among psychiatrists, uh, but also outside the medical establishment. And then while well, criminal profiling, uh, also a uh, very uh, important question that we need to determine the empirical evidence values and practical implication of assigning psychiatric diagnosis to individuals who use extreme ideology to engage in criminal and terrorist acts. And we have, with um, Jim, we have uh, work on an edited book on that particular topic, so it should be very interesting. So, future research. This is what we need to do, at least for this project we have is uh, really to look at um, the technology and have uh, an assessment that will allow us to, to understand where the technology is going. Um, and we need to develop a diagnostic paradigm 
that accounts for information gap. You know, if we use genetics, fMRI, neurogenetics, how are we going to put all the information together and how that information can provide a paradigm to uh, diagnose psychopathy. And as I mentioned here, it's too early to provide a definitive answer uh, how to proceed in terms of the implementation of that technology. So this is why it's necessary to develop ethical, legal, and social standards to guide um, that type of research. The question here is to find support. Because the technology is not there, so the question is how to find support financially institutionally to develop uh, these standards. So from this, thank you very much. One of the points that Dr. Jovaran made, at least, at least implicitly, is that this field of neuroscience and its technologies and, and its use in psychiatry does not exist within a social vacuum. In fact, its focus is in the social milieu. The very purpose of using neuroscience and technologies in these ways, to be able to direct some insight as to who may be culpable of these particular aberrances that we in society deem heinous, horrible, terroristic, and being able to discriminate between what represents the criminal and what represents, perhaps, the pathological, instantiates the fact that neuroscience, neurotechnology, and psychiatry are, in fact, enacted in the public sphere. Because they are enacted in the public sphere with this regard. They are enacted, or at least posed, to offer some protection of those who are the members of the polis. That given the case, one of the things that we heard explicitly that we work with here at the Institute is the call for policy, the same root of the word, policy, the polis. Those things that provide some measure of guidelines that offer stability and protection for those who use it, the polis. In fact, arguably, this is the function of the body politic, is to protect those individuals who are constituent of that population. But what do you do when your population is plural? What do you do on the global stage when, in fact, it doesn't just take a village, when the new village is the new global sphere? When what my colleague Roland Benedicta refers to as the new global shift is manifest through things like social media and, in fact, engaged through technology that allows real-time access of individuals across borders internationally, an admixture of culture, ideologies, beliefs, genotypes. What then is the structure by which we so look to engage the ethical practices that we've just heard so as to guide the technically right, morally sound, and ethical probing of these techniques and practice in effect? And moreover, given the fact that none of these things exist in a social vacuum, what is the mechanism by which we can then leverage what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. Well, perhaps on some level, our moral compass and our contributions of various systems of ethics, and perhaps new ethics necessary to deal with this, might be useful. But ultimately, although I'd love to stand here before you with my ethicist hat on and say that good ethics make for good laws, that's not the case at all. Very often what ethics provides is systems of operation for acting within the scope of the law. Might be that the final common pathway, the final common arbiter as to whether or not the use of the science, these techniques in medicine or in some other field are actually executable in these ways rests, at least to some extent, on the law. We spoke earlier about Fry and Albert standards, and ultimately the issue is this. How then are these techniques and technologies leverageable within the law? Are they leverageable within the law? Given the strong social pull to do something, and the equally strong social stance of do it in a way that is legally right and protect us, such that our maxim of innocent until proven guilty is the guiding force 
that sustains the value of our society. And many of those that, in fact, are predicated the same way, lest we then fall into the trap of Hitler's Germany and Stalinist Gulag Russia. Well, to address this issue, to address the idea that on one hand we want our scientific cake and we want our libertarian values and need it too, it is our final speaker of the day, former Chief Judge Advocate General of the United States Navy, Rear Admiral of the United States Navy, retired and senior fellow of the Potomac Institute for Policy Study, Admiral Court. Thank you, Jim. Uh, let me start by saying that from a practical standpoint, I probably have uh, more hands-on experience, although I'm not a terrorist expert, but I, I had a great Navy career, and not only was I the Judge Advocate General for two years, I was also head of the Naval Investigative Service for two years, and as such, was very much involved in terrorism. In fact, the first uh, anti-terrorism center in the United States was set up by the Navy in my organization, and it became famous when a gentleman by the name of Pollard who worked in it and took all the secrets and, of course, sold them. But I have some particular instances that come to mind, specifically some of the talks here this morning was or this afternoon. The Iowa case. Does anybody here remember who Petty Officer Hartwick, Clayton Hartwick is? <clears throat> Does anybody uh, really understand what went on, what went on in, in that? And the reason I bring this case up is I don't think all the pre-knowledge would have ever predicted that he would have done this. Uh, he had a fairly normal life, and he was had no particular bent on doing anything other than being doing a big thing and being not forgotten. He, uh, uh, the, the part of this that, that is difficult is the social aspect of it, is that not only the country, but particularly the Navy, could not handle this. Would you tell us what it is? The Iowa. I'm sorry. Would you All right. The Iowa, Thank you. about uh, 20 years ago, while they're uh, practicing gunfire, a 16-inch round blew up in the barrel. The barrel uh, did not explode, but it wasn't the projectile that blew up, it was the powder that ignites the propellant. The propellant came back into the handling rooms, the turret, and took all the oxygen out, and of course burned and killed everybody in the turret. Uh, we did several investigations. Uh, the major one came out was uh, done by the Army Explosives Laboratory, and they they pretty much concluded that somebody had to ignite the bag, so there was no way for it to uh, spontaneously combust. But that meant a sailor had killed 19 of his fellow shipmates, something that is unheard of in the Navy before. The public couldn't handle this as a sailor doing this. The Navy specifically went out of their way because of political concerns to make it look like it was an accident. The long story short is the Army Explosives Laboratory analyzing every bump in that turret, every powder burn, every piece of chain on the ram that shoots the thing up, and came to the conclusion that there was a 1 in 12 to 30 million chance of it being an accident. Congress came on You can't, You can't make that prediction. So they ordered the Navy to hire Sandia Labs to come in and do an analysis and prove that it could be an accident. Sandia, I'm not criticizing Sandia, said there was a 1 in 16 chance it was an accident. Believable. Well, I was there at the final presentation, and I can assure you it was the most embarrassing presentation I've ever seen because the conclusions they made, and I know a little bit about statistics, were, were in, they were impossible to make. But it was all done for political reasons. So you have all this social context, political context, and I was going to talk about it last, but I read it at first just because I want to talk a little bit about that case. The other pieces of information that you sometimes get, another terrorist incident that I was involved in was the Beirut incident where the Marines, 232, something like that? 249. 249. A very major tragedy. We established a long commission, 
to go in there and do an analysis on why did we not know this was going to happen. That, that big, full of all sorts of classified intelligence. But it came down to one thing. Did we have the information that a yellow truck was going to come in to the barracks with explosives? And the answer is yes. We knew. But we also knew about 50 other thousand things. Mm -hmm. 50,000 things. There was no way to sift through that information and get it to the point where it was actually usable, which is a major problem in the military today, mm -hmm. intelligence infusion. The other thing I wanted to cover was we seem to be interchanging the word terrorism with criminal activity. Um, somebody put the definition of, uh, from the uh, Secret Service on what terrorism is, and they mentioned three things, religion, uh, politics, political or ideological um, reasons for doing this. Um, but all the incidents we show, there is, that isn't there. Ted Bundy doesn't have that. Uh, certainly, uh, um, the Columbine people didn't. Their kids, they, they didn't have any particular thing. They just want to do something big. So we got to be careful when we talk about if we're going to use neuroscience to, to deal with technology, with uh, terrorism as well as criminal activity. And I try to keep them separate. And that brings to mind, what, what do we start with? What apparatus do we need to handle neurotechnology, or neuroscience rather, particularly imaging, which I find a little bit difficult to handle? Uh, who's in charge? Is Congress in charge? Is the federal government in charge? If the federal government's in charge, who's in charge there? FBI, CIA, or is it the Homeland Security? Or is this really a state issue? Should the states be worried about this? or the scientists. I bet the scientists think they're in charge. But they're not. Because whatever you do has to be done within the current legal framework. And I'll go through some of those difficulties now. Let's start with profiling. We talked about profiling and, and how, uh, what we would have to do. Well, profiling is not a popular thing in the United States. Two current instances or recent instances is at 9-11, we went to, well, let's check everybody off out that gets it onto an airplane. Why don't we profile? Israelis have done it very successfully. Um, well, that's not the way we do things in the United States. We don't do that in America. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna in any way make any group feel they're suspected in any way. Well, what about <coughs> the racial profiling incidents on the New Jersey Turnpike not too long ago. And this is a, a profiling where they weren't trying to discover somebody who had a propensity in his mind to commit some sort of evil act. They were looking for ongoing crime. They even had more reasons to do it. And when they profiled, they will show you statistically that they found more crime doing that than by doing it randomly. And that, that was proof, scientific proof, that profiling does work, but it doesn't work well here. If you're going to profile, the first thing you have to do, I think, is form what I would call the suspicious class. Now, we know that a good deal of our terrorism, particularly in the religious area, are Muslim. But you can't work backwards from that. You can't say Muslims are terrorists. That, that, that doesn't work at all. So you have to be very specific when you define what's in that class. When you look at the class, uh, what are you going to take into account? Religion, nationality, personality disorder, other mental condition, a loner, a hermit, somebody that possesses radical political views and maybe a past criminal record. Well, you're, you've got so much to deal with here that how do you come together and make a reasonable class? And if you do succeed in defining a suspicious class, and you might be, then you have the issue of do we test? Who do we test? Who do we look at? Do we do random sampling? Do we do members uh, of the class who have exhibited, exhibited certain uh, misconduct in the past? 
And three, do we look at the whole class? You have to decide that. How are we going to do this? Now, how do we capture that person? Suppose we identify, suppose a guy sitting over in the corner, we, he's got all that profile and it all works for him. So what do we do with him? Do you arrest him? For what? Do you detain him? How do you do that? Um, do you ask him? Do you think he'll do it voluntarily, he or she? <laughs> I don't think so. So, what do we do with a potential criminal? There's only one way to find out what's in the mind, and that's either talk to them, and how many criminals are willing to do that, <laughs> or you've got to do some other neuroscience, <coughs> put it all together, the beautiful colored pictures that Jim put up, or that somebody put up. Yeah, Jim put them up. They, they, you put that all together, and um, what do you get? How do you get that information? Well, you know what? Any search and seizure in the United States law requires a warrant. So I submit you're going to have to get a warrant. Now, to get a warrant, which has to be signed by a judge, you need probable cause. You need a reasonable probability that a crime has been committed and a reasonable probability that that's the person and a reasonable prob and you might want that plus protection of evidence. Well, American law says you can't be uh, prosecuted or in any way be subject to a warrant if you haven't done something. It all revolves around conduct. It's not what's in here. The law doesn't understand that, and it, will, it will, may never understand that. But it may try and it may not. I don't know. We'll see in the future. But that warrant is going to be very difficult to come by. With you, uh, you have to have a court order. That's the only way a warrant will do it. You might try an additional new statutory scheme somewhere where the, um, am I with my hands okay? <laughs> Congress might pass a law and say, hey, we're going to make an exception here. Well, you still got the Constitution that keeps getting in the way of everything. You know, you got a right to privacy. You have a right to, if you have an expectation of privacy, you have to have that right. Otherwise, it's, a, it's of no value. And when you start making inroads into this thing, then the constitutionalists, the originalists, will start saying, no, wait a minute. If you do it here, you're going to do it over here. It's sort of like mandating health care. It's sort of like, <laughs> I'm going to make you buy health care. Well, I want you all to buy Chevys. You know, why do we buy foreign cars? So you, you, you get into that constitutional realm. And in order to pass a statutory scheme, it has to be a uh, federal crime or some nexus to the Constitution. And what all these nice laws that we have from Congress revolve around is the thing we call the Commerce Clause in the Constitution. And back in the 30s when the New Deal came about, President Roosevelt decided to use this legal theory to be able to pass laws to begin to order people's lives in the United States. We're talking about not only commercial transactions between states, but inside of states. That particular theory was tested by the Supreme Court. And if you recall, President Roosevelt packed the Supreme Court because he lost it the first time around. Had to come back a couple years later, and they passed it and said, yeah. And ever since then, it's been Katie bar the door. We've gotten one statutory scheme after another. This is going to be a critical year on those kinds of schemes because the Supreme Court is going to hear the health care issue. And it's going to decide whether the Congress has the power to make you buy something. And if they do, then there is no limit to the Commerce Clause. I don't know what they're going to do, but I cannot see anything other than the Commerce Clause is peaked. So that's going to make it very difficult to write something like this. Again, in American jurisprudence, until you, you can only 
there are only three basic crimes. There's those that are prohibited by statute. There are those that are uh, prohibited by common law. And then there's conspiracy. But each one of those crimes, anytime you prosecute somebody on it, you must have an act. You can have an attempt. An attempt of a crime is you can be found guilty just as easily as you can of the crime itself. But you have to take an overt step towards the, towards the uh, uh, perpetrating that act in order for it to be in any way controllable by the government. We don't have that here. We don't have anything close. Um, so how do you get that? How, I don't know. I honestly don't have an answer, and I don't know if anybody else has an answer. Suppose, by some reasonable process, we get through that hurdle, and we do find somebody, and through our neuroscience, we're able to predict that that person has a propensity to commit a crime. And I, and I learned something today. I thought all crime was evil. It isn't all evil. Because some people, it's like the newspapers say, one person's terrorist is another person's free fighter. And that makes it even more difficult. Uh, suppose, though, you do. And you get all these readings, and it's clear that this is a bad mind. Now what do you do? treated? How do you treat somebody that doesn't want to be treated? How do you do that when uh, the person is not cooperative? And maybe you do find out all this information. You get this information. You got to go back and force treatment because they're not going to accept it. And how, how am I going to be treated? What are you going to do? Some surgery? Are you going to do some more imaging on me? Are you going to do some brain manipulation? That's when the ethics starts to happen. What do we do now? How do we correct it? What's good and what's bad? There aren't any standards for this. There's nothing drafted anywhere that I know that says, this person's sick, we can make him well by doing this particular thing. I mean, psychiatry is, that's why it takes so long to become one. <laughs> because it's just a difficult thing. And I don't, I don't see, uh, again, I don't know that, um, you can get the cooperation of the entire legal judicial system, the cooperation of the Congress, get by the political problems. We all know that no matter what uh, position somebody in Congress takes, there will be somebody else that will take the opposite. And while there's no direct threat to saying nice people, it's a class. Those classes that are on the edge always don't, they, they want their prerogatives. Uh, you have, that's why the, the minorities react to violations of the, of the, civil, uh, the civil Rights Act of 1964. They don't want even close to it. You know, that's ours. Leave it be and don't touch it. So we have all these issues coming down. I think also, in order for you to come up with some sort of scheme, whether it be statutory or otherwise, we're going to have to have the support of the American people because they will stop it. If they don't think it's productive, when you do analysis and you come up to the conclusion that someone has uh, the brain that's going to make this kind of decision, um, how do you know you don't have a false positive? Mm -hmm. How do you know that, you know, what looks, what, what every criminal has this doesn't mean that uh, having this makes you a criminal. It's sort of like what we talked about when we started, which was um, being a terrorist doesn't make doesn't uh, make you a Muslim. Being a Muslim doesn't make you a terrorist. So I think um, before this gets down too far down the pike as to this specific use of neuroscience, um, I, I think you have a lot of work. And um, I just don't mean, I wouldn't even know where to start because it's so difficult. I also wanted to mention uh, a little bit about lie detection because there's some indication out there that this will be a, uh, useful in lie detection. And I don't know what the, 
success rate of diagnosis is, but I read something that said it was 88%. Well, a polygraph is better than that. And if you think you're going to spend an expensive thing like a, a, the uh, neuroscience to determine if someone's lying and still only have an 88% uh, probability of success, you have basically an unusable tool, tool, at least in a court sense, in a judicial sense, because there is no court that I know of that routinely admits lie detector tests. And it's what's good for the good is good for the gander. If a criminal can can't pass the lie detector test, you can't use it against them in court. But then again, if he does pass it, you still can't use it in court. So it works both ways. And that's that's basically I don't see. Uh, the neuroscience application being any better at this point than what we have, I do think that it might be very usable in uh, polygraphs that we do for security clearances. There are certain employee employments that you have that you have to be polygraphed, and it might be very useful there. But I don't, I don't foresee, unless you can come out with 100% or 99.9% accuracy, I don't see it uh, usable in a criminal context. Okay. Did I miss anything? Thank you. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to break us for about five to ten minutes. And the reason for that is simple. We gave you a lot to swallow here over the past couple of hours. You know, there was an old commercial for TDK tapes. I uh, remember this commercial. It was a photograph. It was a guy in a chair. And there was a speaker in front of him, and his hair and his tie was sort of blown back like that. <laughs> and I'm looking over the sea of faces, and I'm thinking, hmm, there's a little bit of that right now. But you know, what you saw at the bottom of that was he had, he had a little drink right down by the side of him. So we've got little drinks right next to him. <laughs> so let me tell you how I'd like to do this. I'm going to follow in General Reese's lead. And what I'd like to do is, if you want to you know, run to the restroom, feel free, go right ahead, right next door, right over here we have a little bit of wine, a little bit of cheese. Now what I ask you to do is be a one-fisted wine drinker. So pour yourself a glass of wine and come on back in. I'd like to have us reconvene here at about five to four, at which time I'm gonna have a panel of all of our speakers with an open Q&A bit discussion for about 15, perhaps 20 minutes until our discussion runs out, at which point we'll then have the rest of our wine and cheese reception and a more casual networking and interaction. Thank you very much.
such a clear idea. That's such a clear idea. It was so clear. And yet, the main thing is that's so fine. So how are they going to take it? Yeah. Okay. Good. I was really curious about that. I didn't know. 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 I did
why we do it. That's, that is the focus of the lecture. I really am able to do what I do. Thank you. 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 Thank
parties. And what they did was they lost more than the cultural system. That's the thing. And then they, they listened to the language and they picked up the this is this is a Thank you. 
part of the panel is, hi, my name is Jim Giordano. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'd like to do at this time is just open up the floor for a general Q&A to any or all of our speakers. And what I encourage you to do is simply have a raise a hand as usual. And you can either direct your question and or your comment to one of our specific speakers, or just throw it to the floor, and what I'll just do is mentor the discussion as best possible. And we can go for about a half an hour or so. Unfortunately, Professor Yoharan has to catch an airplane, so he needs to leave right before 4.30. So if there are any specific questions for Professor Yoharan, I certainly do recommend you asking them early. It's sort of like voting in Chicago, asking early and often. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to open it up to all of you, please. <laughs> Sir. Professor, seeing how you have to leave, I'll ask my second one first. Okay. <laughs> on psychopathy, we're willing to tinker with the uh, brain. When are we going to get to the point where we stop saying we're willing to tinker with the brain due to tolerance and just say eliminated from society? You mean psychopaths? Eliminate psychopaths from society? Yes. Don't try to, if we're, if we're willing to tinker with the brain, yes. ethically go that far. Yeah. This goes to the death penalty. Why aren't we willing to just not even tinker with it and just eliminate them because we know they're a bad seed? That's 45 caliber therapy. <laughs> no, but there's, well, but look at the different states in our nation mm -hmm. as it was addressed at the Republican debate the other night, too. That came up. So I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Well, I, I, I want to make sure I understand what you, you're asking because I'm not sure. When you say eliminate, <laughs> <laughs> lock them away forever. Uh, I don't want them living by my children or grandchildren. I don't know if you want them living near you. So if we're willing to go far ethically to tinker with the brain, are we willing ethically to make the call? But who's going to make the call? I don't, that's what I'm asking well, you. But, but this is the problem, and we don't have an answer. Because I think what we have to decide is whether a psychiatrist and I think psychiatrists, I know the answer. I, I work with a psychiatrist, he will say, no way, I'm a physician. So it goes against, and, and maybe uh, some other people might disagree with that, but it seems if you look, look at the, the code of ethics of psychiatry, they don't want to be involved in that type of uh, work. Uh, so uh, I think it's going to be problematic also from a legal standpoint, um, because again, if you look at the psychopath, it's more patient than a criminal. Uh, and so then you have professional ethics versus social values. And here we're going to have a tension, and we have to discuss that. We need to have that discussion taking place, this open debate. And we don't know where we're going with that. So, but uh, you want to add something? Uh, no, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, I don't. Here. Oh, oh. Yeah. Um, well. I guess I, I understand the, the question really is um, part of that can be part of that could be phrased. Okay, do oh, just, um, is there any chance that we're asking of, of uh, preventing any recidivism if we attempt to treat it? Okay, if we can agree that it doesn't seem to work. I think that was the essence of the question. What does work? What does protect society? And I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. that that's, that's sort of the rhetorical yeah. question. There's 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 a, there's a, the goal is, the, the question is, what we're balancing off here is, um, what's our goal? Trying to return this person to society or trying to protect the rest of us from a high probability of recidivism or something in between a hundred million. Well, it's a cascade effect. It's a cascade effect, exactly. Because then you're going to talk about pedophiles, then you're going to talk about serial killers, then you're going to talk about exactly. who are you going to take out? Here, here's, the, here's the problem. First of all, it's unconstitutional. <laughs> <laughs> Small <laughs> matters. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, why would you treat a mental disability any different than a physical disability? <laughs> yeah. A person that can born with Down syndrome isn't going to be that productive. Where do you stop? Where is that line? Okay. But, but let, let, me add, let, me, let me play devil's advocate, if I may, yeah. to, to the judge advocate general. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of feel like Pacino doing that. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
what, what? I have to say first. <laughs> yeah, I have, my mother actually looks like Al Pacino. Right? <laughs> 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 um, well, that's my wife. She's in the back room. My mother really does look like Al Pacino. <laughs> so one of the one of the issues that comes up is what I sense is this sort of slippery slope. Is. And what tends to happen is it's not a true slippery slope because that's unmitigable. But what tends to happen is the, the slope itself, the slope, x over y, becomes ever steeper. And that becomes very, very difficult even when you put particular mitigations or impediments in the way. The momentum was rolling down that hill tends to just rapidly overcome that. Let me give you a historical example. No, history does not repeat itself. We fail to look those, at those instances and then basically reinstantiate these same type of errors in new situations. That, that's the reality of what happens. So let me, let me ground this situation, because this sort of it, it flows this way. What, will, what could easily happen is an ethical legal neurocentricism that in some way relies upon neurocentric criteria for normative values. Now that's not that unusual. We do that in a number of other ways. However, Although the argument certainly stands, and there is a very frank ethical legal mitigation against eliminating these types, because that has a rather national socialist agendaism that goes along with it, there is indeed the other way that says if in fact what we can then do is identify phenotypes and genotypes. At what point do we identify a phenotype that has a high predictability ratio to then intervene early on and shape the trajectory of what this individual is allowed to do? And B, if in fact we identify the genotype, do we then look to eradicate that genotype in utero? So we have to be careful because many of these new technologies, inclusive of imaging technology, coupled with biomarker identification, have been posed in a non-sort of futuristic agenda, in a very realistic agenda, to be important prenatal diagnostic tools for a number of neurological and psychiatric disorders. So if, in fact, psychopathy and things that are related to psychopathy along a broadened spectrum axis might, in fact, be included under this rubric, we then see the potential to sidestep constitutional mitigation or constitutional restriction and constraint by saying much the same way we leverage with, for example, ABU 702 or in the UK, the Embryology and Fertilization Act, that these are, in fact, eradicable disorders that then represent a socio-moral burden to our population that should be repaired prenatally. So, well, where are we with respect to being able to predict um, uh, uh, adult onset or adolescent onset paranoid schizophrenia. Okay, can, can I say something about that? Sure. We're looking at that at AAAS, is how you can identify schizophrenics before the first psychiatric, before the first psychotic episode. Up till now, there are some scales, that, which are essentially psychobehavioral scales, and then they're all right but they produce a lot of false positives. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons being that, that typical, ad, many teenagers are odd and, and have trouble <laughs> relating to people and all sorts of things like that, and they're gonna grow out of it. Or they're, or, or, but they're not schizophrenic, they're just, right. they're just being adolescents. Oh, so, so, and the, the genome, the way of looking at genes to try to distinguish has been a total failure and probably always will be. I mean, that seems, well, most people think that's, then, that's hopeless. Uh -huh. But they, there is, there are people who think there is promise with imaging studies. That you would take this group of adolescents who are coming to clinics, because they're not, you're not just gonna go into ordinary mm -hmm. classrooms, who are coming to clinics with, with troubles of some kind, of referrals from parents, from school teachers, whatever, and that through neuroimaging, you could then pick out the ones who are truly gonna be schizophrenic. It's in the future, but some, there are people who think within a decade we can do this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then what do you do with them? Because sure. because the uh, the antipsychotics are not that great. Anyway, so, so then you get into a whole other thing. Is what do you do once you've identified them? But then it's a wonderful question because what this really does is this sort of this uncaps Paul Rubolfi's question about the whole nature of prodromal anything. 
Yeah. I can only call something prodromal once it in fact become dromal. But that's if exactly. I it's retrospect. It's Which retrospect. Is the action criterion. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, a retro, it's a retrospective here's, diagnosis. Here's the issue, though. Is that all our laws revolve around conduct. If there's no conduct, there's no misconduct. Mm -hmm. In the case of uh, incarceration or any kind, of, there are two ways to do it. Either you get convicted of a criminal act or you're declared incompetent and sent away to the rest of the, um, mm -hmm. you know, asylum like we used to do that. Then along comes the Supreme Court, remember? Mm -hmm. uh, 10, 15 years ago, it said, you got to let everybody out of the St. Elizabeth's. You can't keep them. It was more like mid 70s. Yeah, but yeah. that was a while back. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 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 it is. In the context of our, our structure, of legal uh, structure, can't be done. But let's take another variable in here just to, just to go back to the question. I think part of the question that came out with psychopaths reflects your use of evil. Okay, is being a different characterization, right? Because we, when we go back, that was a very nice allusion back to 18th century, the foundations of, of modern psychiatry, and Pinnell and others in the early 19th century, where you actually regarded some of these, that, where we regarded the person who was not responsible for their actions in that way, but engaged in, in, in these kinds of acts as um, being morally culpable although not rationally common. And, and the comments on that would be, but that's, that seems, can we define that? And that's defined by the groups of people, because each culture will look at the act differently. Right, and we are uncomfortable. Yeah. In our law, we do not make moral decisions necessarily. Anymore. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes, ma'am. Um, doing making. Dr. Jean yes. mentioned, I think, that in Germany, they are with fMRIs being able to treat psychopaths. Yeah. I wouldn't say treat. Mm -hmm. They're developing the technology, and it's a brain yeah. fMRI brain computer interface. Okay. So it's a it's a type of biofeedback mechanism. Okay. You read, you scan the brain, you understand which parts of the brain are not activated in psychopath. And the idea is to train these individuals to activate the region of the brain associated, associated with morality. But the technology, uh, they're developing the technology. They're not treating psychopaths. Right. Okay. And it was also said that we know the traits of a psychopath. And my question is, how early can you identify them? If in the future there is a way to retrain the brain, and if teachers can pick out the students from a fairly straightforward criteria, could we catch them earlier and retrain the brain? Well, I, 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 I'm not as in-depth as, as what these guys are, but I know that um, we, were, we were working with a kid who, his frontal lobe was not as active. But he had some of the uh, characteristics that could have eventually developed into a psychopath. Um, what I did was I worked with him and we, I just re imprinted the brain, the brain in a different location. We then sent him down to Salt Lake. They did, they did some um, MRIs. Now you're talking 10, 15 years ago. And the feedback we got was how did you do that? But what we did was we did a, a reprocessing of how we gathered information and where he did with and, and um, processed that information, which is what he's talking about and what these guys are talking about. They're, they'll leap further once they get it down with the technology pieces of it. But it can be done. Uh, this, this young man now owns like five different real estate well respected in his community and he no longer has those traits. But it's a it's a real thing. There's a, a, a saying in my field that it's never too late to have a happy childhood. <laughs> <laughs> that comes from you know from Harrison and there's a book about that called The February Man in which a lady came to him and was sure that she was not going to be a competent person. 
and help the mother, etc. So over the course of about six months, Milton age regressed her, inserted himself into her history, and then grew up with her as her mentor. It's an Amazon thing. I mean, I think they, they, what, one of the things, I'm, I'm sorry, I what, one of the things that, that is critically important as well is not only how these neuroscientific and neurotechnological as well as psychiatric approaches are leverageable in adulthood, there's a particular vulnerability with the child on a number of different levels, and it's biopsychosocial. We see the vulnerability of childhood not only manifest with regard to a much wider developmental window, which may be opportunistic for intervention, but any intervention in childhood really runs the risk of the double-edged blade. You have harms of commission, because what you're actually doing is you're intervening on developmental trajectories that are speculative. And what you're having to do then is to take all the variances of childhood in that particular brain, taking an N of one focus and then compare it to a large enough data bank that's very difficult to do in childhood, particularly looking at neurocentric traits and characteristics. And then what you're trying to do is manipulate that in such a way and make a predictive trajectory as to what these manipulations will do, given a host of number of variables inclusive of what's called adrenarchy and gonadarchy, which is at the early stages of puberty, which is sort of the hormonal drag shoot and ultimately the full-blown expression of puberty, which is basically a catastrophe for most children. Or most, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and, and parents. I mean, not, but, and the reason I call it literally a catastrophe is that you have tremendous shifting in architectonic plates with regard to the whole ranges of their developmental trajectory and potential. So interventions early run this very delicate risk of omission and commission. Of course, that was something that the President's Council, that was something that uh, a very prominent Harvard psychiatrist, Professor Dr. Benemann, was taken on the coals for. And it's still a hugely contentious issue with regard to treatment enablement and enhancement of the child. It's one of those issues that my colleague Elena Singh at University College London, who also works with us at the University of Oxford, who was also a AAAS uh, speaker and scholar at the- At the big program we did at AAAS. Right, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the great program in Biotechnology Futures with Paul okay. Rupolpe, looking again at the nature of prodromality. And what do you do with the nature of a prodrome when you may also have shifting <coughs> criteria in this child's adulthood? So there are a number of convergent predictive variables that create a tremendous risk set that not only have to be appropriated biomedically and technically from the scientific point of view, but then also socially and ethically, and of course legally. So it's, it's, that's an interesting question. Yes, all, all these cases are voluntary cooperation. Mm -hmm. You cannot get anybody to cooperate involuntarily. In right. So what terrorist do you know that's ever even going to let you touch him? I mean, that's just not going to happen. So this is a, a laboratory experiment to me. Until you, and unless you come up with some legal scheme and technical scheme that can solve that problem. Agreed. One of you know, I, I I don't think it's I always think it's best to sort of keep your science fact and your science fiction apart. But very often, science fiction portends not only our hopes and fears, but also possible windows of science fact opportunities. And a lot of times, you see a translation of that, particularly if you wait long. The whole idea of what we're really doing, the whole idea of whether or not neuroscience and neurocognitive science is leverageable in this regard, has been the subject of science fiction before. Interestingly, we were on the other side. That science fiction is on a venturing candidate. So if, in fact, what we're looking to do is to say, well, right, we have an individual who, in our country, quando in Roma, when one is in Rome, is, in fact, doing something very contrary to what we view as Rome, and what is the standard by which we should then reappropriate the neurocognitive function? Or do we just deport? And on what grounds? Right. We're back. So it, it's very, very contentious. Yeah, we're coming to the uses of technology. So that's why earlier on, what I focus, when we take a look at it, where can the technology be used legally now? We can use it for investigation. We can use it for intelligence work. We can use it for forensic work. Is it something, because there's no act the box that said action off to the side for a reason. You need an act to trigger legal action in one way or another. And it has to be conspiracy linked to an act or something else. So the reason, again, when we say neurotechnology sit with the self in that box, that's exactly where they reside. We really will have trouble extending them any further. 
And the other point about the brain and the systems here is, we've heard, and this is one of the confusing things that we're facing right now, the category of psychopath, the category of narcissistic personality disorder, all these categories that we see running up and down, we're not static states like that. We're coming to the recognition, coming to DSM-5, that we really don't want to be as categorical as we consider dimensions and where people fit along certain notions and certain dimensions. I would suggest that we're going to find there's some characteristics that are pretty much immutable in the way the person is going to act, certain characteristics in the way that they operate psychologically and neurologically. And certain aspects can be very heavily modified by those other influences. And the statement of our problem is, what can we do with those? Those influences, because the person will engage in them voluntarily, or they can be used therapeutically. Those are the things we gotta look at. The legal use of them, how they fit into our current system, what can we do, what can't we do. And perhaps one of the things, one of the things I've taken out of this is we really should sit down and map these things out. That may be one of the first steps we need to do in terms of the project, in terms of this kind of a project, to see what things can we utilize now without any legal change or ethical, whether they're considered ethical and legal. What kind of things might have to be considered for changes in policy and or law where we can make an argument. They're in the gray area right now. How do we define them? And maybe how might we have, want to change some of our existing sensitivities to deal with these problems when we weigh all the factors up. And, and you, you have to remember what you heard here today was there's neurotechnology and there's neurotechnologies and neuro approaches. Mm -hmm. Okay? The neuro approaches is the one that people don't typically talk about. So I introduced some of that, okay? But it's not something that most people talk about because it is going to be one of the most difficult pieces by which to legally and ethically and policy wrap your hands around. Okay? Being able to walk down the hall and do something to somebody is doable. Mm -hmm. Extremely doable without them knowing. It. It's have just to, scary as hell. It is scary. <laughs> and it's easy to walk down the hall and identify who you have quickly. Have them go into an altered state. Apply an influencing approach and have them come back out with what you want. Scary that is doable today, and that is going on in, in research environments to understand how well we need to do that and train people in that. And how do you think good salespeople and others have always operated? So this what is you're nothing doing, new. No, you, what you're doing is you're taking excellence <laughs> and you're enhancing it yeah. in a whole Start different it. environment. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, no. yep. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to keep dragging you back to the yeah, because, because because I know that. And an advantage to those early diagnoses, we have an example right now in Alzheimer's disease mm -hmm. with the ADNI project, which maybe some of you are familiar with, where they think they are beginning to see with a complicated algorithm of various, to see if it finds spinal fluid or whatever, which of the people with, with um, uh, what do they call it, minimal cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that, which of those people are gonna develop into Alzheimer's disease and which aren't, and, and because not all of the people with that kind, some of those people go to live to 95 with that minimal impairment. Um, the advantage of being able to pick up the ones who are truly gonna be Alzheimer's patients is those are the targets for your clinical trials. Those are the people, we don't have any way to treat them right now, so we can identify them to no, to no good, but the good is that they are our targets for clinical trials, and it will be, the, the, that's how I conceive of it with schizophrenia too that those would be the targets for a, for a new approach to, to treating the disease chemically, where before it was a full-blown uh, disorder. So let me, let me throw you something. Might it then be a possibility that much of what we discussed here, and literally all the way from one end of the panel to the other, would be to target those individuals through multivariate means, as you heard here today, and rather than incarcerating or simply removing from society, engage, notice I didn't say use, is that engage these individuals 
in clinical trials where the outcome would be the sustainability of their socially viable behavior and the avoidance of a potential slippery slope. If you know what to do during those clinical trials, mm -hmm. I mean, are you going to do some of her black magic, mm -hmm. or, or, or do we have some chemical solutions? <laughs> Which is great. Okay. What, what so, if we so look so at all of this as uh, rather than being a disability or a problem, we look at it as a talent. As a psychotic has a, a very unique or a diversity model. But, yeah. <laughs> but I do think one of the problems you have here is when you cross a particular social threshold that engages actions and harms against others, the viability of, gee, that was the most talented evisceration I've ever seen, may not necessarily be tenable. <laughs> so, I mean, again, you, you sort of have the, the, the public and private offense criteria that is very, very leverageable. And once those criteria are at least approached, or, or you see that's a possible trajectory endpoint, I think what tends to happen is talent then wanes in the face of potential harm. Oh, sure. Yeah, so I, I, that, there is a neurodiversity argument that goes along with this, that mm -hmm. there's a strong pushback that I want to make sure mm -hmm. that the people understand. Yes. there's probably some reasonable debate about whether it's really criminal or it's a, a psychopathic condition. And so one could imagine incarcerated, maybe not because of the rape, but maybe they've gotten out or something, that there you could try a randomized trial between those who are chemically, uh, uh, whatever the term is, um, for no longer having this, That's right. That's the word. Um, <laughs> like chemically castrated. <laughs> 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 you know, maybe there was some blonde or something. I don't know what that's like. In, 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 in mixed company. It's so <laughs> chemically castrated, <laughs> and those who would be willing to try your black magic. And there would be no way to blind that, obviously, because people who aren't chemically castrated probably you know they're not chemically castrated. But you could give everybody either drug or placebo. And it sounds like you can run your black magic without me knowing you're running your black magic on me. So it's possible to even blind the study and that would be a population where you've already you already know they're in the gray zone um, of while if they've been incarcerated they've already been identified as criminals but there is this debate about is it criminal or is it compulsive or whatever and that would be a subject pool you could try to try on it's a problem there's a problem. There's there's such a thing as uh, rules of research with human subjects, and and there is a disinclination to do deceptions except in very mild psycho what kind of experiment psychologists do from time to time. Um, and I bet you couldn't get that through any IRB in this country. I bet I could get it through any IRB in this country <laughs> on the basis that there would be no greater deception than in any double-blinded trial where all subjects knew that they might be randomized to either condition. The, well, the, the, the deception I'm talking about is altering their minds without telling them that's even part of the experiment. That's no, no, what no, I no. And I didn't say without telling them it was part of the experiment. You would tell all of them okay. that it was part of the experiment, okay. but you would randomize it. That's fine. I, I might turn to of the real world uh, share what might be interesting to some of you. There's a, uh, a fairly well-known psychiatrist named Gene Abel who presents every year at the American Psychiatric Association. And uh, uh, he has been for some time particularly interested in treating sexual offenders, for lack of a better word. Uh, so what he has done is he got uh, put out the word that as a therapist, uh, if there were sexual offenders who were not yet caught, they could so come see him for psychotherapy. And he's seen a bunch and been fairly effective. And he particularly went 
how he did it, I don't know the details of, but he discusses this pretty openly, to the local legal authorities to get their agreement that they would not cap out on the curb to be able to identify these people coming uh, to his therapy. So it's an interesting uh, way in which prior to the formal research stuff being done in a non-blinded way, uh, he's offered something toward, toward that group. Um, I, I, I want to say one other thing, just that there's a, uh, this came up uh, as we were discussing it. So I, I've, I've elaborated, I know you have to go. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I understand. <laughs> Yes, there's been in our discussion the uh, discussion of a professional uh, uh, obligation of, of doctors that they buy into, and then uh, uh, Jim and others have talked about uh, uh, the forensic exception to that. And I just want to say there's a philosopher from Israel, uh, Michael Gross, who has written on the ethics of military action and so on, and he says that, well, in terms of that, is docs highest duty uh, to their patients mm -hmm. as we in this country uh, tend to see it? Uh, and he says, that, well, if you live in Israel, where in fact you might have your enemy right across the border wanting to wipe your state off the map, uh, there's a stronger case, which is the case he makes, that a doctor's highest loyalty is actually to the country in wi of which he or she is a member, uh, as opposed to the profession. If so, uh, not that that would uh, uh, push the argument completely the other way, but it would uh, uh, at least make the professional argument mm -hmm. that we're talking about really <coughs> come out differently. It's interesting. There's actually a very old platonic and Aristotelian ethos that goes with that called proximity. So the closer one is to me, mm -hmm. the greater the common good that I then leverage upon mm -hmm. him. So it doesn't in any way abrogate the physician's claim of best interest of the patient, mm -hmm. but what it does is it regrounds it to the issue of proximity, which it's interesting. I mean, you know, this, this comes up a lot in those discussions, of course, in military medicine. I have two people, they're both dying, they're both at the same time frame. They both get to me at the same time. Of course, one is my enemy, one is my, my shipmate. Which one do I treat first? Flip a coin. And where does that go in terms of level of valuation? Very interesting. Yes, sir. Dr. Howe, could you talk to a suicide relative, relative to a cultural acceptability or non-acceptability and the <coughs> contagious nature of it? especially in you. There's a number of anecdotal reports. You know, Goethe's uh, uh, famous book about uh, uh, a love-struck uh, man who commits suicide and copycat suicides uh, and so on. Um, forgive me for being sort of scientific. I don't know if the data is so clear of if that exists. I was, for example, uh, uh, there's, as you may know, this is not really responding so much to your question, but sort of related to it. Uh, there's a $60 million study going on in the military right now to try and study uh, uh, prevention of suicide among soldiers and so on. Uh, whether that any of that is copycat or not is, a, uh, is an open question. Um, but one of the questions there is as you do this study of asking Part of that is asking persons who have been soldiers who have attempted suicide, uh, asking them about suicide after their, and one of the questions is, uh, would that pose a risk of possibly uh, increasing it? And uh, one of the studies that, uh, uh, it's by Gould, G-O-U-L-D, from JAMA in, in uh, 2005, in that study they found that, which to many of the clinicians in the room, is not that surprising, that uh, uh, it may be that asking, doing screening questions, giving people a chance to talk about the sort that may actually benefit them. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I'm punting on your question and saying that uh, uh, what the status is of copycat suicides may still be un unclear. Yeah, there was a South Pacific Island, though, that two, three years ago had a number of youth that all of a sudden, it, that's why I asked the yeah. contagious nature. So it's just part of the nature of why we talk about part of the nature of also why we might want to consider cultural or social network storylines <coughs> or lives that they buy into or roles that they buy into and act out. There's a whole process behind that that we really have not adequately tapped. How do these storylines or narratives that we buy into, that's why I sometimes say, you know, Suppose you're Gary Cooper walking out to the OK Corral, okay? When you think you're doing that, you've bought into a role. 
we do this all the time in our different cultures. And that's something maybe we want to watch to see what roles are resonating. This is on the intelligence side. What roles are resonating with individuals if they're broad, if they're widespread in society? You know what? These copycat kinds of things are perfectly understood. I'm thinking about it to begin with. And it's floating out there. I'm relating to this already. I'm already predisposed. And you know what? So-and-so did it. It's kind of like the I'm part of the team. I'm part of the virtual team who bought into this social network organized around this life story. And I think you'll see that in Goethe. You'll see that if we look through classical literature. I see if we look at that today. And this is sort of the frontier, the virtual, that's why I say the virtual social networks that are created by this are a very interesting thing to look at, and it's something we now have the tools, or at least the idea, because of our coming to our technology that we can get into. That's why you're getting into the collective consciousness. Yes. And those things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was very interesting what you just said about the collective suicide mentality, and I wonder if there's any applicability to the suicide terrorist organization. And another thing about your presentation, which I thought was interesting, was that you said individual terrorists might not have a psychopathology to them. But however, if you're a suicide terrorist, suicide is generally considered a psychopathology. How do those two well, factors align? Only in this country. Okay. Only in the Western country. Yeah. Okay, you might but then even I, would, I could think of a couple of instances where suicide might not be a psychopathology in yeah. this country. Like, right. you know, uh, debilitating illness. Take a look at Scott Atran's article, Who Becomes a Terrorist in uh, Perspectives in Terrorism from 2008, I believe. It's a very interesting discussion about how suicide terror groups and these groups are recruit through soccer clubs. It's an analysis. It really gives you a feeling for the um, social network aspects. Other questions? Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, I think I got the act part, sir. Okay. Now, try to follow my psychotic mind. Uh, when you're at war and the rules of engagement on the battlefield, you don't need the act mm -hmm. to engage. That's right. All right. The pendulum never stops in the middle in a society. We're at war right now. You take off everybody being a PhD and relatively well educated in this room. <laughs> Uh, you go back to where I was raised, that tolerance level is done. Mm -hmm. And in most of America, it's probably done. Mm -hmm. Folks would say, the hell with this. I know somebody's bad, just kill him. That, that's what I mean, man, quite, quite frankly. Kill them all and God sort it out. That, that's right. Now, I'm, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with that. I'm just saying that that is uh, possibly a blue-collar approach to things. And I love blue-collar, trust me. It doesn't make any difference. Now, that said, that you don't need the act for war, that men make laws, men can change laws, and the pendulum does not stop in the From a scientific <coughs> point of view, when that pendulum shifts and American, American society wants to see a change, how will the scientific community deal with that relative to what you talked about today in the crazies? Okay, it depends on the scientific community that you're talking about in regards to the crazies. Okay? The type of discussion today to either help or hinder the identification of the crazies. Okay, so the scientific community that came together in 2001 at the Pentagon, at the Joint Staff and OSD, followed the logic that you just talked about. No, that's good or bad, but keep going. Okay. <laughs> As part of that, the holdback was illegal. They provided the standards. And that drove where we are today. Now, I'm not saying it's good or bad. Yes. Okay? So that provided the sanity check. That was the first time that you had Tommy Franks, who I was engaged with in the staff, okay, where they actually had to start talking to the legal side as to what they were going to do or not do in the field. The inform based on carefully, based on information that I was doing. Okay, I'll just use myself and some other stuff. So based on the things that I got very quickly, I provided my input. And my input was sort of along the lines of what you're talking about. 
okay? This is the way the culture is. This is what they expect. If we're going to do this, this is the course of actions you take. It's not typically the course of actions that most Americans would think of taking at that time, but this is the course of actions you have to take. If you don't, we're going to be stuck in this, in this issue, in this war longer than expected, okay? There's a lot of ramifications that at the top end with regards to what's going on, the tactical and operational. And then that, from my perspective, and this is just my perspective, it's not in the either end, that, that got wider and wider. Yeah, but that's okay. You're, you're going to have to rule law. Title 10. So well, what, what, the rule of law. That's so foundation. Title 15. That's right. Title society. 50 that's right. Law. Yeah. So when you're in the intelligence community, more or less on day one, what you learn is when you're overseas, mm -hmm. you have the authority, in fact, the expectation you are going to break laws. Foreign laws, not American laws. You're going to break foreign laws. And that's what you, that's what the intelligence, and they have the authority. It's not, uh, I mean, Title 50 says. Back, back in 2001, sure. we both intel and ops. Sure. That's where I was on both off. sides, okay? Mm -hmm. It yes, was there. real tight on the intel as well as on the ops. Mm -hmm. Based on what he just said, it was real tight on both. So okay? let, me, let me follow then. They took, they took the cascade effect of it. Yeah. So let me say, it, it seems to me, looking at the whole day, this isn't directed at anyone, and I'm, it's going to be kind of provocative, is deliberately, is that um, uh, there's a certain comfort to ignorance in this field, the fact that we're not really all that certain about the predictability, about our ability to, to do, uh, you know, that great or perfect intervention, so whatever, with, with some exceptions, but there's a, you know, uh, so so maybe it's interesting in a research environment, but gosh, the implications get us into these huge legal and ethical uh, considerations. But uh, uh, thank goodness we're not really all that certain at this point. So my question is, to what extent is that kind of comfort and considerations throttling the, the, the scientific The, the comfort, the comfort. The fact that the, what I'm suggesting, provocatively, across the line, is that we are that that the scientific community is more comfortable with a status quo where we can say, oh, we're not really all that certain, and they prefer it that way, and therefore we don't pursue the kinds of developments that would lead us to the science science fiction uh, futures yeah. wherein we could do. Well, I'm, I'm going to argue this as a neuroscientist and just sort of pop it on over to you, carry it like that, and ultimately you can get it back over to the clinic, because I think it's important. I would argue very strongly, based on my own experience, that the face that the scientist assumes, that the characterological face of the scientist, is, is kind of bipolar. On one side, there's the humility, and of course, you, you work in this field academically for years, but there's the humility of saying, well, I'm always going to err on the side of contingency because I find myself married to this philosophical mindset of science that I know that if I really stand too tall and beat my chest, three years from now somebody's going to come along and prove me wrong. Booker. So what I'll do is I'll always use all of those qualifying might, could, however, maybe, etc. And you see that a lot. On the other side, there's the scientist who makes the assertive claim that borders at the edge of correlation and causality who makes very, very strong claims, it is such, and backs this up with their particular orientation to the type of statistical rigor really they've done, and perhaps duplicative experiments, not only in their group, but in satellite groups, and the network in which they're engaged. And what I tend to find is that that polarity has become exacerbated given the increasing public forum nature that science has assumed as a consequence of internet open access and very, very rapid communication and dissemination of scientific data out of the ivory tower, where suddenly the spotlight on the rigor is there. And yeah, you know as well as I do, science is one of the only fields where you're building for through mm -hmm. But very often what individuals will do is either hide behind that field and say, yes, you're absolutely right, this is tentative, etc. what I would call scientific humility. And on the other side, 
very, very overt and somewhat growing. And I think, interestingly, this is the narcissistic characteristic, <laughs> carry, uh, a scientific hubris yeah. that <laughs> is also necessitated by things like shrinking grant funds, <laughs> other <laughs> types of funding, head awards, etc., that want to get this into the public eye ever more so as a viable social force of change. So that's my particular perception of this, and then I'll certainly hand it over to my colleagues, Carrie. But well, part of the difficulty that we have in science is actually the fact that we're fo not really focused on getting generalizable findings and the principles in. So what we award, I just I just had three major grant review panels in the last two, last two weeks, so to tell you, what we, we reward is research that produces minimal publishable units in the field for science. And to do that, you do an experiment, you spend a lot of time fiddling with the experimental protocol. I joke with graduate students often, you know what? We're going to spend most of our time figuring out how not to do the experiment. Which means you fiddle with the conditions, and you get a result that looks like it worked. What have you really found? What you found is your manipulation was a component of a sufficient set of conditions, all the stuff you fiddled with, to get that outcome. What kind of causal inference can you make from that? You're into the area almost like a liability, as I pointed out before, looking at, in, in, in law and liability, you're at the area, what's the criteria? You can't even say it's a necessary element. So you're at that, science is operating at that level. So on one hand, we don't get that straight. And that's why, as, as Jim was saying, you can get shot down in a year or two unless you push for that. Um, the other part is that we, really do have a feeling of the limitations of how far the scientific explanation can go. When I teach philosophy, history, or science, you sort of go back, well, in Aristotle's time, every part of the body had every aspect of function stuck into it. So the only reason my finger couldn't think is because it doesn't have the right tissue that it can think, but it couldn't potentially do that. What we've done if we trace this through, and one of the, one of the things we, we go through for as a key point is Descartes. Um, what do we have there? We have a machine that for all these things is not a human being, but let's have this thought experiment. We have this machine that can do all this stuff. And says in the end, well, you know what? There's still this part that is sort of the, that we're talking about when we get to the moral and decision-making sides of it that we just can't explain. And you know what? There's a lot that we, we know that there's a lot that we can't explain. So a lot of the reason that we, the reason we haven't made it further in this area is we frankly have not gone back and looked at what the dimensions really are of what we're taking in and acting on and looking for what they're setting off in the brain. That's the idea of the project that Alenka and I were talking about in terms of we take a look at person. Suppose we're engaged in a story, okay? We're signaling each other. We're looking at each other around the audience and you know what? There's a language going on in a whole conversation that we are not conscious, we're only partially conscious of. What are you guys signaling to me? How am I pacing the way I'm speaking to you? And what is that feedback that I'm looking for triggering in my brain? No one's done that. That's what we're setting off to really, no, in terms of looking back at what's going on in the brain. That's the key. I think also yeah, these are the pieces that we're proposing to do to get that. Yeah. Yeah. I think neuroscience is particularly problematic because of something I allude to often, which is the omnipresent heart problems as so defined by David Chalmers. And unfortunately, the, the formal and efficient causal mechanism, the, the explanandum of mind from brain, remains enigmatic. Mm -hmm. And so virtually any one of these approaches tend to always be speculative at best. And so, yeah, I can do great things with regard to cellular automata networks and the way neurons and glia may work in concert. But what happens when you literally put all those together? Now, of course, there's the engineering heuristic that then says more than likely you will get some precept on this once we're able to reverse engineer the brain and I'm involved in that project. But this is one of the problems also, is I think that what tends to happen is those of us who work actively in neuroscience recognize that it's you know, it's a glass house because any particular concepts that I then avow 
could be very easily dissolute if, in fact, my particular orientation, my philosophy of mind on which I base that science, tomorrow is disproved. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm working in cardiology, for example, if I'm working in myophysiology or endocrinology, the majority of the functional explanations are there. So that's it's very, it's tenuous, I think, that's what really sort of compels a lot of neuroscientists to sort of either be very, very humble or, or have this sense of hubris. Yet this is my philosophy of mind as a result of that universe builder's mind. So it's kind of interesting. And be mindful that this is what, what Jim just said, and one of the words he used was re engineer, which is what, mm -hmm. what we're looking to do. I've, I've got the neuro side of it, but they want to know what this looks like inside here, and I want to know what it looks like in here, having this side, okay? But I'm also doing the re engineer, which is different than a reverse engineer. Okay? And, and based on what coming off or leveraging off what Carrie just said was um, as I become more engaged in the university environment, which I haven't for, for many years, okay, I have and I haven't. Um, what I found refreshing from your side of the, of the, of the, of the world, okay, is that you're looking at things without knowing other things that are going on. So you, you're looking at it from things that, with the perspective that this is not happening, or this has happened, but it hasn't come, you know, as far as we think we, it has. Um, and what you're producing from that is some, some new areas and some new approaches that I reach into and pull and utilize and evolve differently, okay? Or I evolve and then work with Carrie and Jim and others to evolve in a different environment. Um, what exists and what doesn't exist, I wouldn't say that that, that is the, the words anymore, that's the right word anymore. I would say what does exist and how is it evolved. Okay, because there are various venues and, and segments, not just in, in our country, but in various countries that are doing various types of research that is both in the lab and outside of the lab. People are starting to learn, especially from this engagement we've had in 10 years. And it's not just U.S. and I think I'm saying U.S. or it's, it's the U.S. and NATO and others, okay? But they're starting to, they've learned over the years that they can do things in the, in the field, certain type of research, that they don't have to bring back into a closed environment. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, let's take one more question, because then we can continue the discussion over one. Yeah. Right. I just would like first to thank you truly for this great discussion today, and I'd like to raise the issue that do we do you feel that or believe that we need to make a distinction between individual cases like people who are psychopaths who are doing crimes or evil, and ideologies that changes nations, and this mm -hmm. is can have completely different approach from one that's very focused, microscopic, monumental style of approach to individuals to a broader and bigger societal changes by completely of oh, relatively different tactics. Like with the Nazi, for example, the end of the Nazi was not by bringing every individual Nazi to try to manipulate him, but by giving the whole culture attack them a sense of defeat followed by changing their educational systems, plus, plus. So I just wanted to, to see your views about this uh, distinction between the two cases. Mm -hmm. Actually, Fred, do you want, do you want to take that? Yeah. All I wanted was deferring to you oh, all. Yes, yeah, just, oh, okay. Sure, yeah. Go for it. Well, I'll tell you how I start by, I, I start by assuming homogeneity, and then I look and see, are they different? So what you start with, let's start with the assumption that we have individuals who have certain characteristics being placed into certain, I will call them experimental scenarios, okay, that are being set up here. And I will ask the question, when I look at measures that I think make sense, I'm looking for the neuroscientific basis. Are they all the same? That's my knowledge, that's my hypothesis. I look in and I go, I know, I expect actually for them not to be. Because as Karl Popper said, the only valid scientific hypothesis 
is one that's falsifiable. I don't want to confirm the idea. The answer is yes, there are going to be differences. There are going to be some similarities that predispose, and there are going to be certain differences, and what we want is a strategy to understand the underlying dimensions in a way that we can utilize them operationally. Mm -hmm. Very good. <coughs> what I'd like to do is I'd like to thank virtually all of our speakers, and of course, absent Dr. Joe Durant, who's not catching the plane. A very, very round of applause for the audience. I want to thank you. It was a nasty day today, and I'm <laughs> Now the sun is out. It's wonderful. Thanks for joining us today. Please pay attention to the things we've got, and please join us for wine and cheese. Thank you. 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 Thank you.